Good evening and welcome to our weekly Cerebrovascular and Skull Base Symposium of the University of Miami. This is uh, our 19th session of the Thursday series. Uh, I'm Jacques Morcos, Professor and Co-Chair of the Department, uh, Director of Vascular and Skull Base Surgery. Uh, Co-directors of this course are Carolina Benjamin, Assistant Professor in our Department, Director of the Keynes Dissection Lab, specializing in brain tumor and skull base surgery. Mike Ivan, assistant professor, director of research at the UM Brain Tumor Initiative, specializing in brain tumor, skull base, and epilepsy surgery, as well as my two endovascular and open vascular partners, Bobby Stark and Eric Peterson. Uh, this is uh, wonderful Miami. Those of you who visited will recognize this iconic picture at the top left. At the bottom are our two main hospitals, University of Miami Hospital, Jackson Memorial Hospital. Naturally, we're a high volume tertiary referral center. Housekeeping instructions for tonight, audience members, please use the Q&A box at the bottom to send your questions throughout the lectures and we will address them during the discussion time at the end. We don't offer CMEs, please share uh, the links for our weekly seminars, both the Wednesday and the Thursday ones in your social media, if you think they are uh, worth uh, listening to. Uh, uh, I will remind our two speakers two minutes before the end of their 25 minutes of the time to keep us on schedule. Please send me any, uh, any suggestions you have for future topics. I am uh, continuing to build future topics into December in cerebrovascular and skull base or any speakers you would like you would like us to consider. This is my email. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, for next Thursday, uh, we will have a vascular topic. We'll have Elad Levy from Buffalo and Rafael Tamargo from Johns Hopkins talk about endovascular and microsurgical aspects of aneurysm treatment, and at the bottom right is the link to register, uh, but you already know it since you registered on uh, this one today. Uh, the Wednesday series that my partner Mike Ivan has been holding even longer than my series here uh, is the Miami Gl uh, Global Brain Tumor Symposium has been extremely successful as well. I encourage you to join next Wednesday, same time, 5 p.m. Uh, for George Samandura, so we'll talk about pineal and third ventricular <coughs> tumors. Uh, many thanks to our whole team that makes this happen. Ingrid, Roberto, Cristina, particularly Ignacio, who runs this uh, symposium every week. Uh, these are different ways for you to connect with us, to watch previously recorded sessions, they are all on our website through the link you see at the top. Uh, you can connect with us, email, Instagram, or Twitter accounts. It's my pleasure to welcome our five panelists today. First, Marvin Berg-Snyder. Marvin is a dear friend for many years. He's professor and director at the UCLA Pituitary and Skull Base Tumor Program in LA and has a vast experience, particularly in pituitary surgery, and he will be one of our panelists today. Thank you, Marvin, for joining. Apio Antunes, all the way from Brazil, as if it, uh, you get extra point for being in Zoom from another country, eh, Apio, but welcome. Apio, also a friend for decades now, associate professor, chairman of neurosurgery at the University Hospital Porto Alegre Medical School in Porto Alegre, a vast experience in pituitary surgery. Roy Cassiano, now who I've known, I guess, exactly 25 years since I've been here, 25 years, he's been here longer at the University of Miami, uh, one of, uh, well, the head of rhinology, sinus, and also skull base, 
uh, my partner in crime in most of these surgeries, along with the other rhinologists, of course, with whom us neurosurgeons work with here at University of Miami. And Roy will, will, will cover some topics in uh, skull base repair today. And very importantly, our two colleagues from endocrinology who really run the medical aspect or endocrinologic aspect of our pituitary program, uh, Atil Karji, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in Endocrinology, originally from, did his medical schooling in Izmir uh, in Turkey and has been here several years, and Alejandro Ayala, who I hope will be able to join us, uh, Associate Professor also of Endocrinology, has been here many years. Uh, these two gentlemen uh, are absolutely essential, of course, to the pituitary program, and we would, I'm sure you will all want to hear some endocrinological aspects to the care, to the care of pituitary patients. So now on to the two speakers of the evening. Let me start with Nelson Oyeshiko, who is Professor of Neurosurgery and Medicine of Endocrinology. He is the Al Lerner Chair and Vice Chair of the department. He is a co-director of the Pituitary Center at Emory University in Atlanta. Nelson has uh, done his medical schooling at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. That's where he's from originally. Then did an MS in occupational medicine in London, then PhD at Emory in neuroscience. Co stayed there for his residency in neurosurgery at Emory. Has been there ever since. Uh, uh, I cannot begin to list all the list of accomplishments that Nelson has, but this is, these are just a few. He is, of course, currently the World Federation of Neurosurgical Society president-elect. His term will start in August of 2021. He's past president of the Congress of Neurologic Surgeons, of the Society of Neurologic Surgeons, past vice president of the American Academy of Neurosurgery, past chair of ABNS, RRC, ACSS, ACS Board of Governors, past president of International Society of Pituitary Surgery, and of course, probably most of you know him as the most able and most creative and amazing editor-in-chief of the journal Neurosurgery. And uh, between all of these things, he still has time to operate on, I don't know how many hundreds of pituitary tumors a year. Perhaps he will tell us. And uh, Nelson is beloved. You can see there, Gentle Giant Award at Emory that he received several years ago. You can see him with his family there in the middle, and you can see him celebrating his Nigerian-African heritage at the bottom after he was uh, uh, elected WFNS president-elect. So Nelson, great and warm welcome. On to Eduardo Velotini a friend of many years. Eduardo is neurosurgeon DFV at Neuro in Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Eduardo did his MD and neurosurgical residency in Sao Paulo University, did two fellowships, one of which was, which was of course quite uh, influential for two years in the mid 80s with Majid Sami in Hanover, then did uh, another one with Univ at the University of Pittsburgh in Naligam Shekar in 1990. Uh, he, went to, uh, he went on to specialize in skull base and pituitary surgery. You can see all his accomplishment as coordinator of skull base group, Hospital de Clinicas in Sao Paulo for about, uh, for 80, from 86 to 2000. Then at Hospital Servidor Publico in Sao Paulo till 2016. Then he became coordinator of Sao Paulo's skull, skull base group, coordinator of pituitary diseases group at the Hospital Sirio Lebanese in Sao Paulo, and currently also at Hospital Alemao Oswaldo Cruz. And Eduardo specializes particularly in complex anterior skull base and pituitary surgery. So we have two superb speakers for you today to discuss the topic. And uh, I don't know if Nelson will have to leave us for surgery later. Uh, Iggy, can, my mouse doesn't work. Can you stop me sharing so Nelson can get his uh, talk, please? Yes, doctor. I can, for some reason, yes. You got me? Thank you. Yes, doctor. 
Nelson, I invite you to load your slides, unmute your microphone, and start your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jack, and um, all fellow panelists and um, participants. It's, um, it's a tremendous honor to be a part of the uh, symposium. Um, um, as Jack um, alluded to, uh, I've been tasked with uh, leading off this afternoon, talking about functioning pituitary uh, tumors, and, and uh, we'll discuss techniques, results, and, and lessons uh, that we, we would uh, impart to someone else and that we've picked up along, along the line. Um, I work at Emory University in Atlanta. We have a pituitary center, which is a multidisciplinary group of physicians looking after these patients. Um, I do not, I do not have any disclosures uh, to uh, to to speak of. So let's lead right off um, into the topic at hand. Uh, so functional tumors of the pituitary gland, of course, arise from the specialized cells of the anterior pituitary. Uh, the, the, the big three, as I like to call them, uh, Cushing's disease, which is from the corticotroph lineage, um, the uh, acromegalyx or the gigantism from the somatotroph lineage, and then the prolactinomas from the lactotroph lineage. There are two other groups of, of uh, functional tumors that I think are there um, uh, mentioning, but they're rare enough that I will just touch on them in this discussion. And those are the gonadotropinomas and the tyrotropinomas. And it's also true that oftentimes these um, cells will combine to um, have uh, co-secreting tumors. Um, such as, for example, uh, co-secretion of growth hormone and prolactinomas, which is very, very well seen, or gonadotropinomas and tyrotropinomas, or Cushing's and prolactinomas, and so on. As a group, I think it's fair to say that the uh, functioning tumors are, are rare diseases um, as, as a group in general. So uh, for those who uh, de dedicate a substantial amount of their time to pituitary and skull base, we'll see many of these tumors. So I will touch upon the syndromes, the, the treatment, presentation, and so on. I'll discuss the techniques as a group towards the end, and I'll mention lessons that we've learned along the way. So this is, uh, there are three figures in this, um, in this slide that I think are quite important. So the pituitary gland has a topography to it. And by that, I mean that their cells that uh, occur in different locations. And in general, they tend to respect those borders. It's not absolutely uh, concrete, but it is significant enough that I be I, it bears mention. For example, growth hormone tumors and prolactinomas are most likely found in the lateral wings of the, of the gland uh, and generally originate there. They may not stay there, but originate there. The anterior pituitary uh, uh, has what's called a mucoid wedge where the uh, corticotrophs generally tend to reside. And the other thing about the topography that I think is important in terms of exploration of the gland looking for tumors is that there's something called the pars tuberalis, which means that there's part of the anterior pituitary that ascends along the infundibulum. And it is in fact the case that some tumors will arise uh, within the pars tuberalis or uh, are, are transinfundibular tumors. For example, Cushing's uh, I've operated on at least three cases in this location and also growth hormone tumors. And then finally, although the posterior lobe is usually not the area of origin, it is in fact the case that tumors of the anterior pituitary can start out in the posterior lobe. And I think this is extraordinarily important when looking for microadenomas of, of, uh, of uh, the anterior pituitary to keep these things in, in mind. Um, the blood supply, of course, as you know, is um, the majority of it is coming through the superior hypophyseal and the portal vessels. The inferior hypophyseal uh, mainly um, goes into the posterior lobe, and then there's a lot of uh, artery to vein and vein to vein um, uh, blood supply. 
So let's start off with Cushing's disease. So the fair market value for the instance of Cushing's is about three per million to five per million. So if you do the math from, for example, where I live in Atlanta, we have a six million uh, 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 catchment area in the city and 10 million in the state, which means you see about 30 to 50 cases a year. The prevalence is high, of course, and it's, a, it's, it's fair to say that Cushing's is a morbid disorder and it is not fun living with Cushing's because of the diverse uh, and severe um, uh, consequences on metabolism, general livelihood, and some things that are tend to, people tend to ignore with Cushing's are the psychopathology and the cognitive impairment. If you do an MRI on a patient with Cushing's, you'll see a lot of frontal lobe atrophy, uh, almost like the patient had CTE, for example. Anxiety, uh, depression are very important parts of Cushing's. And of course, we all know the other stuff that's more common, diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis, immune suppression, and so forth. And if it's left untreated, it will decrease life expectancy uh, for sure. So how is the diagnosis made? I know we have uh, endocrinologists on the panel. I'll be very quick uh, through this. Um, the most important thing, first of all, uh, um, in the setting of, of suspicion on the basis of clinical um, um, uh, uh, parameters is to first establish that there is hypercortisolism. In other words, the patient's making too much cortisol. That can be answered, that question, by 24-hour UFC, for example, as a screening tool. And then uh, lack of diurnal variation um, with the midnight salivary cortisol, um, which would be obtained uh, after, after the patient normally would be uh, going, going to bed. And that should be high in Cushing's, and in those that do not have Cushing's, it won't be. Um, then the, you have to establish ACTH dependency because Cushing's obviously is an ACTH dependent corticotrophadenoma. It's just that the set point is higher and you can answer that question by ACTH levels and the CRH stim test. And then to establish a pituitary source with a low dose dexamethasone suppression test, which in patients with Cushing's, <coughs> they will not suppress, whereas in high dose, it, high dose is the eight milligrams they will suppress. And then uh, the IPSS, I'll show a couple of um, 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 charts on this in a minute. This is a very useful tool to establish pituitary source, and particularly in cases where the MRI is negative. Um, and, uh, in, and that's in about 20 to 30% of patients where the MRI will be cold stone negative, but there will be a tumor that resides in, in the pituitary. There are some functional imaging studies available, the methionine PET that's been used in some centers where um, you can pick up um, very small lesions that do not show up on the, uh, on the uh, MRI imaging. Uh, there are a lot of things that could mimic Cushing's and it's very important for a surgeon to be mindful of this. Things like cyclical Cushing's, um, incidentalomas, ectopic adenomas, and pseudo Cushing's. And 16% of the population at large will harbor a microadenoma. So just because there's a microadenoma doesn't mean it is the microadenoma. That's a very important thing to look out for. So the issue of an IPSS, this has, be, this has been a, a very useful st uh, study. It's been around for decades now. And the principle is that you measure the effluent of ACTH coming from the anterior pituitary gland and compare that to the periphery. And then uh, you take baseline and then uh, post CRH stim, like you see in this graph. And in a patient who has an ACTH adenoma within the gland, you will have this spike uh, following CRH, indicating that the lesion is probably in the right side of the gland. And in this case, you can see that there's very little uh, difference between the left uh, side of the gland and the periphery. So on the basis of this, even in the setting of a negative MRI scan, a surgeon can go in to explore the gland, looking for a lesion within the gland, preferably in the right side. Here's a case from um, two weeks ago that I operated on uh, here. And you can see this is a case where both sides, both the left um, in the pink and the right in the blue, both showed stimulation following um, um, uh, CRH stim uh, stimulation at this at the at point uh, zero and so the this in this kind of a case it makes it more challenging to go and explore because the lesion could be just as well on the right as on the on the left 
And in fact, uh, on exploration, I did find an adenoma on the on the patient's right side, and the prolactin is used as a as a um, as a reference uh, level, uh, indicating good placement of the catheter. And this is the raw numbers. So an IPSS is a very useful study uh, when it is positive. Uh, it can be difficult to interpret when it uh, does not localize, and sometimes you get false localization based on uh, on uh, uh, venous uh, anatomy. There, I listed here the series of ter therapeutic options for Cushing's. Fair enough to say that the number one and the best by far treatment for Cushing's is surgical uh, exploration, resection of an adenoma, uh, in, uh, and if you do that, uh, the patient will go into remission and that is the, the most durable and the most effective means. However, we do know that not everybody goes into remission. Some patients, for whatever reason, either because the adenoma is not found or they have an invasive tumor, will require adjuvant therapy. And you can see here from the list of medications, whenever there's more than one medication for a, uh, for a dis disorder, you can probably uh, figure out that the, that means that there's not one best medicine there are several options, and in the case of Cushing's, there are, uh, ranging from neuromodulators uh, in this group to biosynthesis inhibitors that cut into the um, synthesis of, uh, of the uh, cortisol itself, those that block the cortisol receptor, such as bifepristone, uh, somatostatin receptor uh, analogs, and then this new fellow, oscillodrostat uh, utrisa which is uh, a, a biosynthesis inhibitor. And when medicine um, um, fails, uh, sorry, when surgery fails, uh, stereotactic rated surgery is a, another excellent option to consider and medicine can be used um, as a temporary uh, bridge until that works. And then finally, if all else fails, there's the BLA or the bilateral uh, adrenalectomy. So what are the uh, what are what's the fair market value for um, results of of uh, Cushing series? And I I just uh, the, on these next two slides, there's a variety of series that um, I've taken out from the literature, and I will tell you that one of the things in terms of interpretation of these series that's very important to keep in mind is the definition of remission. The definition, as you can see in this column here, varies from from author to author. Some define remission as less than a cortisol of less than five. Others say it's less than two. Others say it's less than two plus uh, 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 a low dose dexamethasone suppression test that uh, indicates remission and so on and so forth. But it's fair to say that the numbers probably range from about the mid 60s to as high as the, uh, as the low 90s. So in general, um, it's somewhere in that, in that ballpark. And these two uh, panels uh, uh, basically illustrate the range of series out there. And you can see most of the series are uh, an N of somewhere around 100 to 200. Now, in, in our shop here at Emory, here, here are the criteria that we use. We use an AM plasma cortisol of less than two micrograms. And typically we monitor that in the first day, second day, third day, and so on, until the patient reaches a nadir. Uh, of two micrograms uh, or less. And then after that, we'll get a 24-hour UFC, uh, and then the patient will be discharged on hydrocortisone supplementation. And then post-op, uh, uh, the, as an outpatient, they'll undergo the rest of the dynamic testing to uh, cinch down the, the, um, the, the fact that the patient is rem in remission. And I always tell patients and my residents and, and uh, is that the beauty of this of surgery for for functional tumors is that you can assess uh, success to within a decimal point. Um, it's that precise, and so um, and I think very important for the surgeons uh, in the audience to remember that that the 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 benchmark is very 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 stringent, uh, and 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 uh, that's the what we have to adhere to. The timing of post-operative testing is usually within the first few days, as I said and then we repeat the full uh, panel uh, about three months, and then thereafter on an annual surveillance as long as the patient remains in remission. Here's our series. Um, this is uh, and, uh, we, the patients in the yes column are those that went into remission after surgery. 
and the, the in the no column are those that did not go after they go into remission right after surgery and you can see for us we are about 84 percent induction of remission in, in cases of primary transphenoidal surgery at at emory those there are some things in red here that affect and can uh, our consequences uh, of of, uh, of lack of going into remission for example uh, 30, almost 30% 30 of the patients who did not go into remission had some form of cavern, cavernous sinus invasion. Um, patients reached nadir within uh, a few days, so it's not a long hospitalization to detect whether or not the patient has gone into remission. And if you find an adenoma on pathology, chances are that the patient will go into remission if you get a gross total resection, whereas if you do not, uh, then it makes it less likely. Here's um, our patient flow chart. I'm not going to go into that detail. This is the details um, of our outcomes of surgery. And I, I mentioned before uh, of this series of patients, 91, 85% went into remission. And those that did not and recurred were treated in, in a variety of ways. So what are the options for persistent or recurrent disease? Uh, first of all, you have to uh, make sure that you've done that post-operative assessment to determine remission early. Uh, the most common cause for lack of remission is either incomplete removal. Uh, in other words, you got 80%, 90%, but that 10 or 15 or 20% is still there. Uh, or the patient had an undetectable tumor, a negative MRI scan, a negative exploration, a negative pathology. So that makes it less likely that you're going to get a remission. Patients with dural or extracellular extension into the medial cavernous sinus, the lateral cavernous sinus, and so on are also patients that are less likely to go into remission. And if the patient is not in remission, and uh, the best time to go in, if you have to go in for a secondary exploratory surgery, is as soon as possible, whilst your memory is fresh, the field is fresh, and there's less scar tissue, and so forth. And of course, if surgery is no longer an option, then medicine or radiosurgery, or in the last effort, adrenalectomy. So the three, um, three major groups of medications are the, uh, those that work on the ACTH tumor itself, somatostatin receptor, uh, glucocorticoid synthesis inhibitors, and then the receptor antagonist uh, itself. So these, the first group of drugs obviously reduce cortisol levels, but also um, uh, have positive effect on tumor growth. So parsereotide is the, is the, um, is the, 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 um, uh, stand by for that. Glucocorticoid synthesis inhibitors will reduce cortisol levels because they impede synthesis of cortisol. And then the receptor antagonists will actually show uh, uh, elevated levels of cortisol because they basically affect the receptor. So these are the drugs that are in these categories that are, are approved for Cushing's disease. This is the newest of them. It was uh, approved just in March and it's an oral uh, um, uh, reversible inhibitor of cortisol synthesis. We have uh, a patient on this at this at the present time in our in our institution. It, it works very well and it's well, relatively well tolerated compared with some of the others. So radio surgery, when when it is necessary or if it is necessary, um, has a very good track record in in in, um, in Cushing's. I think of all the. Um, functional tumors, it probably has the, the, the best for Cushing's. Uh, the lag time is somewhere around uh, a year and a half to two on average. There is some uh, concern for hypopituitarism. So we typically will advise patients, particularly women who are uh, desirous of fertility prior to undergoing that to store some eggs so that uh, they can sort of preserve uh, chance of uh, fertility. And in general, tumor growth is not a real concern with Cushing's uh, disease, it's more of the uh, effects on functionality. So what are some take-home lessons on, from Cushing's, that, uh, at least from my standpoint that I've learned? First of all, I would say make sure the diagnosis is <clears throat> absolutely secure before you operate. This is not an anatomic disease, it's not about mass effect, it's in general, it's not about the size of the tumor in general, it is about the biochemical aberrations that result from Cushing. So make sure the diagnosis is correct uh, from a biochemical standpoint. Um, I think it's always important to explore the gland carefully and completely, even if you find a tumor immediately. 
um, don't declare victory just yet. Make sure you've done the job completely because 89%, 90%, uh, 95% is not good enough. It's only good enough when you have 100% resection. And I think it's important uh, to reassess surgical results early and rigorously. And I mentioned already that these are these tumors and these these disorders are can be measured to within one decimal point, if not two. So there's no reason not to be rigorous in the assessment of outcomes. So the laboratory data and the clinical assessment of the patient is the major criterion for rem remission and not the MRI. Go back early and re-explore if the patient is not in, re in remission. I know it can be difficult as a surgeon to admit that, but you know, just park your ego, go back and take a look and, and, and make sure you get the job done. Patients require lifelong follow-up and monitoring because recurrence can occur. I saw a patient about three, four years ago had been operated somewhere else and had a recurrence of Cushing's at 22 years and counting. So it's, you know, it's not over until it's over. Um, most patients do not need any uh, intraoperative or preoperative coverage for steroids. Uh, sometimes people want to do that, uh, but it's not necessary. They're making enough steroids on their own. Um, I've learned painfully that they have uh, a higher propensity for DVT. So we put our patients on aspirin postoperatively because of that risk of DVTs. And also learn that if the patient doesn't crash, in other words, you don't get a significant phenotypic response, you know, with appetite, blood pressure, blood sugar, uh, that sort of thing, uh, then probably is not a cure. Uh, and IPSS is uh, useful, helpful, but you've got to be cautious in their interpretation because you may be misled. Okay, so that's one of the, the first of the big three. The second of the big three is, is uh, acromegaly or gigantism. Uh, Nelson, sorry to interrupt you. Just maybe you can do it a bit more briefly because we're closer to the time. Okay. Can. So, Just, thank you. So um, this, of course, in, in adults, we mostly see the, the acromegalics and you know the syndromes already. Um, the, uh, the diagnosis uh, is made by uh, your plasma IGF-1 levels and confirmed with an OGTT. This is the mortality, statist uh, the mortality curves for patients with uh, hypersecretion of growth hormone. And you can see here that you absolutely need to have reduction of growth hormone levels to restore uh, mortality risk to where it should be. These tumors are commonly invasive at the time of the diagnosis. And look at this. These are all growth hormone tumors. Uh, erosion into the clivus and the sphenoid sinus through the cellar floor, uh, even where there's no supracellar tumor, bilateral cavernous extension, um, and this this sort of lesion, and a NOX4 lesion here. So generally speaking, if you see a functional tumor with this kind of an MRI scan, it almost certainly is an acromegaly. The options, uh, surgery is the first line, uh, just as in Cushing's, and uh, there are a number of uh, potential med medical options out there somatostatin analogs and dopamine receptor agonists and, and, um, and growth hormone receptor antagonists uh, and newest on the lines or oral octreotide. And for those that fail those, um, there's the radiosurgery and the FSR. Long-term remission is um, predicted by patients who do not have cavernous sinus extension and uh, have lower levels of growth hormone below 40 uh, um, going into surgery. This is a complex chart. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but this is the current um, flow chart for uh, guidelines from the Endocrine uh, Society for Management of Acromegaly. And you can see that uh, for the most part, surgery remains the mainstay. The criteria for biochemical remission in acromegaly has undergone evolution over the last 20 years. It used to be you had a growth hormone less than 10 nanograms and the patient was deemed to be in remission. Today, it's a fasting growth hormone less than one nanogram per mil and an OGTT, uh, sorry, an, a growth hormone of less than 0 0.4 following an OGTT. So the bar is very, very high for surgical uh, remission. These are a, a range of, of uh, uh, case series from the literature. And I will caution you that most of these case series that are in existence in the literature were done using the previous criteria for remission. So essentially, they're meaningless in today's world. Um, medical treatment, I've alluded to that. I'm going to skip that over. Um, these are the current treatment options for acromegaly. 
in terms of medical management, and I'm not going to go into those details here. The, uh, the two mainstays that have been around are the octreotide and lanreotide. Both the dopamine agonists, bromocryptin and carbergling are not FDA approved, but are utilized in acromegaly, particularly in patients who co-secrete. Uh, and it, we've learned just recently that these drugs are not benign, as, as benign as they used to be thought. They, they can cause problems with uh, uh, valvular disease if taken in too high a doses. Uh, pegvizomat is the receptor antagonist, and the important thing to note here is that whilst you're on pegvizomat, your IGF-1 levels can drop, but the patient's growth hormone levels will be high. So we talked about the oral octreotide. This has been a boon for patients because it used to be that you have to get shots, either daily shots or monthly shots, and now uh, we can transition patients to oral medication. Radio surgery is an effective alternative for patients with uh, growth hormone secretion. It's recommended according to current guidelines if medication is insufficient to control either uh, uh, hypersecretion of growth hormone or tumor progression on um, the, um, the medication. So those are the indications for it. So lessons learned in acromegaly, use breathing trumpets in patients with acromegaly. They get into trouble very easily with breathing. The bone is thicker, the blood vessels are larger, carotids tend to be more tortuous, the distances for surgery are, are greater, and intubation and airway management are problematic and, and need to be taken very, very seriously. And there are concerns about this going in preoperatively. It, it helps if the patient is treated with medication for a few months before going to surgery. Okay, the last of the big three is the prolactinomas, which are actually the largest group of functional tumors for sure. Uh, they're most commonly seen in women uh, and usually microadenomas, in, and in men, they're usually macroadenomas. Both genders uh, are, are, are exposed to large, long-standing uh, uh, effects of uh, prolactin, such as fertility and, and uh, osteoporosis. There are a variety of non-tumoral causes of hyperprolactinemia, which I will not go into this in, in detail, except to say that the major, major offenders are medications. And of course, the number one, of course, that, that everyone should keep in mind is pregnancy. Uh, the range of uh, hyperprolactin secretion uh, and, uh, can overlap between uh, tumors as well as other causes. So be careful about that when you look at the levels. Make sure that you get, um, get that looked at uh, very, very carefully by your endocrinologist. Um, there is still something called the hook effect, so uh, just as a matter of caution, just because the levels are low doesn't mean that they are low in reality and it helps to get dilutions. And you can see on this graph the general spread between the tumor size, there is some correlation between tumor size and prolactin levels. And when you start seeing prolactin levels in the thousands range, you almost certainly that there is evidence of uh, invasion. <clears throat> The uh, current guidelines uh, continue to recommend medication, medical treatment as the first line of treatment, but I think there's been some change in, the, in, in, in that uh, posture, and I'll mention some of those in, in a minute. Um, the, the two first-line drugs are either bromocryptine or carbergoline. Uh, carbergoline is much more comfortable for people because it's only a couple times a week. And in addition to prolactin levels being normalized in, in the majority of patients, tumors can also undergo significant involution, as you see in this particular photograph. And in those cases, um, they, they obviate the need for uh, surgical uh, decompression. I would caution you that there is insufficient data to support withdrawal of medication, even in the face of the positive biochemical and tumor response. We've learned recently that, um, that these drugs are not as benign as we think. Uh, and, if, and if you are faced with patients undergoing escalating doses uh, above two milligrams a week, you should be cautious and be sure that those patients have their valves looked at. And I think a lot of endocrinologists have become more attuned to this over the years. In men, the, we tend to see more of these, this phenomenon, these invasive macroprolactinomas that destroy the skull base, chew up the bone, chew up the dura. And when you put the patient on medication, for example, they will get a spinal fluid leak. Uh, and this is a case in point such as, as that. And this, this patient came in with a prolactin of 60, but when it was diluted, it was 38,000. So it illustrates that point. 
So what are the current indications for surgery, which they are? Patients with cystic prolactinomas, we've learned that those don't respond very well to medication. Patients in whom the prolactin falls but doesn't normalize or that there's a dissociated response. In other words, the prolactin level normalizes, but the tumor does not go away, doesn't shrink. Patients who develop CSF leak during the drug therapy or apoplexy or patient choice. So there's still a role, a significant role in, for surgery. Um, let me move quickly through this. Radiosurgery is rarely required for prolactinomas in our hands, and I think in most people's hands. And it turns out that the, the results of pro, uh, radiosurgery for prolactinomas are not very good compared with, say, Cushing's, for example. Uh, lessons learned in prolactinomas, always ask about pregnancy. Don't get fooled, don't get caught, uh, or medications that might uh, themselves uh, interfere. Always get dilutions. Start your, your medication slowly because that way you don't run into side effects quick, quickly. Some patients may have persistent hyperprolactinemia after surgery. Sometimes that's due to stalk perturbation. So it's not always due to tumor um, residual. Um, the last two I'll mention just very briefly, the TSH adenomas, these are rare. Um, they're, they occur um, in, both in men and in women and they typically will present with hyperthyroidism, uh, and uh, they're associated with co-secretion of prolactin and growth hormone. Most of them tend to be macroadenomas. Sometimes they're discovered uh, incidentally, sometimes because somebody has measured an alpha subunit that's elevated, and that leads to the detection. Uh, the standby is for, for treatment is surgery, uh, and, uh, and uh, there is medical management for those that do not get cured at the somatostatin analogs. Uh, and then finally, gonadotropin secreting adenomas. These are also very rare, um, um, uh, comp even rarer than the thyrotropes. Uh, they result in, in uh, obviously, ovarian over, uh, hyperstimulation in, in women. And uh, the, the, the uh, first choice of treatment for them is um, resec surgical resection. So I'll make a last few comments about uh, surgery and techniques, and, I'll, and then I'll hand it off. Surgical position uh, for transferoidal surgery, supine, uh, with the chin horizontal, neck neutral for cellar lesions, uh, extension for anteriorly placed lesions, and the head rotated 20 degrees. So this is your classic uh, position for transferoidal surgery. Endoscopic instruments need to be low profile, non-bayoneted, so that they can follow the endoscope in and appropriate length for extended approaches. I like this tool. Um, this is a just, it's called a spyway, helps protect the mucosa from uh, perturbation, particularly the septum and the turbinates when you're bringing instruments in and out. So it's a very nice uh, uh, tool to have. Um, the, um, the steps and in, in surgical approaches uh, I, I've listed here. I'm going to skip those in the, in the interest of time and I will go into the videos in a minute. The major surgical strategy is a wide opening of the cella, access to the whole gland. And as I said, it's a selective adenomectomy in functional tumors that you're looking at. Selective adenomectomy uh, is, the, is the key. Here's your typical uh, uh, rodent um, uh, um, photograph that shows the relationship uh, between the gland and the critical structures surrounding the gland, which must be well preserved. So a selective adenomecta means preservation of the tumor pseudocapsule. This is from, this is from um, um, Jules Hardy's uh, classic uh, description of a selective adenomectomy. This is an adenoma, and that's the capsule uh, uh, around the adenoma. And you can see that there's a clear distinction between the tumor and the, and the pseudocapsule. And if you stain this uh, with reticulin, you'll see that uh, beautiful um, uh, demarcation between is an adenoma and the pseudocapsule. So this is a case of a, a patient with uh, Cushing's disease, a pediatric case uh, with Cushing's disease. And you can see the, the tumor right there where the tip of my arrow is, and the gland is below here. And what we're doing here is a, a careful dissection around the tumor nodule, taking great care not to breach that tumor nodule so that you get a gross total resection. And you enucleate, that's the word for this, is to enucleate the the, the adenoma, uh, just as you see here. Um, here's another case, uh, another patient with a mi uh, microadenoma, Cushing's microadenoma in the left lateral aspect uh, of the gland anteriorly. 
And here's the, uh, the video of, of that case. Here's the tumor right there. And, and what we're doing is we preserve the margin between the tumor and the, the gland. The gland is to the patient's right, my left. And we're circumnavigating the tumor, taking it away from the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, coming around it uh, posteriorly and anteriorly. And we'll continue to prosecute that until we get around the entire tumor 360 degrees. And notice that there's no attempt to breach the tumor pseudocapsule at all whatsoever. And the goal here is to enucleate the tumor on block so that you have a gross total resection and uh, the patient stands a reasonable chance of going into surgical remission. Up here is your arachnoidal margin there. And uh, as you'll see in a moment, we'll continue to do that and uh, tumor will be uh, delivered um, And there it is. So this is the strategy you, um, that um, that is, is is used for these cases. Um, here's a uh, last case, and this is a, a, the last case I'll present before I hand it off. This is a patient with a microadenoma, and this is done with a 3D endoscope. Um, and uh, of course, you can't see 3D. You can't see it in 3D right here. But this is a case where you had we have an adenoma buried at about two o'clock in the um, anterior superior margin of the gland right about there. You can't see it from the surface. You have to peel off the anterior wall of the gland. The rim, that tiny rim of compressed gland has to be peeled off to unearth the gland, uh, sorry, the tumor below the level of the gland. And then you have to then circumnavigate that um, again in the same manner that I've shown in the last two slides. So the best chance, finally, the best chance for remission of a functional tumor or cure is the first time. That's the best time. Repeat surgery is always more difficult and certainly should only be done in experienced hands. An unnecessary avoidable repeat surgery is costly to the patient in excess morbidity and worse remission rates and costly to the healthcare system. There have been clear-cut volume outcome relationships and outcome volume complication relationships that have been shown and so it, it's, it's very important that we um, do our very best to make sure we deliver the best outcomes uh, with the least likelihood of complication and the highest success rates uh, to our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nelson. That's a fantastic uh, didactic and everything for uh, the functional tumors. We, um, so we'll move on directly to Eduardo, who will talk about the invasive tumors in general. So Eduardo, if you can uh, yes. share my screen, load your screen, yeah. Yes, good night for everybody, Max, and all the panelists. It's, um, it's very, thank you for this kind invitation and Congratulations for you and your team because this weekly webinar takes some new uh, knowledge and we can start uh, getting more knowledge during this pandemic. And also, I'd like to say that this, after this talk of Dr. Nelson, it's very responsible, great responsibility to what I'm going to talk here, this outstanding lecture from Dr. Nelson. Uh, I'm going to talk about invasive pituitary adenoma, what, what we can do, how to handle invasive pituitary adenoma. And this is also a teamwork, uh, work of, for almost 30 years with Dr. Aldis Tan, this is suburb ENT. And we have been doing this together for the last almost 30 years. I have no conflicts. And I will bring to you to discussion this. This is a very good paper from the from Brescia, from Piero Nicolai from Brescia. Uh, it's a meta-analysis about invasive pituitary adenomas, huh? and they found in this meta-analysis that uh, they represent between two and three percent of the all the pituitary tumors, and most frequent are non-function and silent cortical trough adenoma. And they put in discussion what is a uh, Invasive was is an aggressive 
pituitary adenomas. So what's the difference? Are the same thing? And this is, this is very difficult discussion because if even we go to the lexicon, if we go to dictionary, invasive and aggressive has almost the same meaning. So uh, I think we cannot separate those two uh, words for the pituitary adenoma. So we are going to get, uh, say, about uh, invasive tumors. Uh, uh, how, how we consider pituitary adenomas as an invasive tumor? Uh, well, we can use three criterions, radiological, histological, and surgical criterions. And we, we must see that s most of the results, they are not congruent. Maybe we think it's uh, invasive in the radiologic, in the MRR, we, in the OP, we see that it's not invasive. We can see that histological is invasive, but the clinical course does not seem to be an invasive tumor. So from the radiologic criterion, the first thing is tumor must be beyond the limits of the cell and uh, probably breaking the anatomic barriers. Yeah? Tumor that goes beyond the cell and breaking anatomic barriers would be a radiological criterion of invasive. Size is not a matter. This is a large invasive tumor. Everything, everybody says it's invasive, but also microadenoma, GH producing adenoma, can invade the, in this case, the cavernous sinus. Another thing that we must discuss about invasive, invasive pituitary adenoma is, is really an invasive tumor or uh, is extension through natural pathway. We'll go back to this paper of Kawazi in 1996, and he showed in 1996 that the limits of cavernous sinus between some structures are very thin and fragile membranes that was very easy to express by the tumor. And we can see here, as he had showed, in oculomotor nerve, this fragile membrane here, uh, between cavernous sinus and gastrointestinal ganglia, and between cavernous sinus and the pituitary body. Those are ways and paths for the tumor to grow, even for tumor if it's not a very aggressive or invasive. Uh, from radiological crit criteria, Hardin in uh, 1976 said that uh, grade three and grade four were tumors that. Uh, cause cellular erosion, not only cellular enlargement. This is, is a large tumor in the sphenoid sinus, but the cellar is enlarged and not destroyed. Different from this patient here, prolactinoma, with a tumor in the clivus with such a large bone destruction. Wilson 84 classified, said that invasive tumor are tumors that have an asymmetrical paracellar extension. Great. D, supracellar asymmetric, or grade E in the cavernous sinus asymmetric. This, in his classification, this is not an invasive tumor, and this is an uh, invasive tumor. And the most used, most used uh, grade, grade for is the KNOSP classification for invasion of the cavernous sinus when he considers the grade 3A superior, 3B inferior, and grade 4. 36 degrees around the carotid artery, the tumors that are invading the cavernous sinus. From the histological point of view, uh, classically we have dura invasion and some uh, proliferative index studies to show ki 67 uh, to, to show in the pathological uh, examination uh, if the tumor is invasive or not. And there are new, new studies about some proteins that would uh, give some invasiveness characteristics of some of those tumors. But even those studies, molecular studies, are not so uh, trustful because they not, uh, are not parallel with the clinical course of the tumor. Uh, I'll show these patients a recurrent GH tumor operated two, uh, 22 years ago and not uh, in remission. You have two more here in the cavernous sinus around the carotid artery. And we 
operate this patient. And we, this is the Doppler, we operate, we open this, the, the dura, this membrane, this is the tumor, very soft tumor, and try to separate as much as possible of this tumor from the carotid artery here. We dissect the whole carotid artery in order to lower the volume of the tumor. We then do some uh, radiotherapy, uh, complementary treatment. And you see, with key, key I67, 1%. Invasive tumor, in cavernal sinus, key I67, 1%. And after four months, we found this tumor in the, in the cranial cervical junction, this is a PET CT, and we operate, and this was a pituitary adenoma GH production in the cranial cervical junction. That would be classified as a pituitary carcinoma with a key EI 67 of 1%. So uh, the invasive tumor is very difficult to determine. Uh, from a surgical point of view, uh, from a surgical point of view, uh, we must say that with the endoscopic wide angle, wide view that we have endoscopic approach, uh, give us the opportunity to be more radical in this, those invasive tumors, that we can go upper, lower, and lateral to the pituitary body. When the tumor goes uh, to the inferior invasion, to sphenoid uh, sinus and clivus, and this is a prolactinome, just like Nelson has showed with bone erosion and all the cranial base invaded by the tumor, uh, from uh, prolactina around 18,000 and with, with carbagolina goes to uh, 1,500, but he developed a CSF fistula and it, we took him to OP, and this is the pictures of the OP, the cavernal sinus full of, uh, the cavernal, the uh, stenoid sinus full of tumor, and this after part of removal, the, the gland, and then the diaphragm of the cella, and this is the Clival dura, and this is a small hole in the clival durus that was responsible for the CCF fistula, and that's a final, the final uh, view of the surgery. And the prolactin level after the third day from uh, 1,500 to 350 in three days. Of course, we did not cure this patient. He will have to stay with cabergolina, but we can lower the prolactin level uh, when we uh, we, we, we take um, uh, uh, low volume of the tumor. For a supracellar invasion, the endoscopic approach, we can use the extended trans, uh, uh, trans, uh, tubercle transplant approach, and he opened a new possibility in very large tumors. These are giant tumors that invade the, the uh, sphenoid sinus, the nasal fossa, and the anterior fossa with a cystic part. And without endoscopic, we would probably do in two-stage surgery. But uh, with this cystic part, upper cystic part, we try to go, maybe we can remove from the uh, poor transphenoid approach. And this is uh, what we see, the nasal part of the tumor, not tumor in nasal cavity, and remove the tumor in nasal cavity. And then we open the dura of the plano here. It's very soft tumor, and we can do this for soft tumor. For hard tumor, it would be very difficult. And then we try to separate the tumor from the rest of, from the frontal lobe. Here and we 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 will see the structures. Long, we will see here the optic nerve, optic carotid artery, left optic nerve, carotid artery, and the tumor. We can separate and then the bulk in the tumor more and more separate in the front, frontal lobe, and then in the deepest of the operating uh, field. We see the, the arteries from the anterior communicating or anterior cerebral artery complex separate the tumor from the arteries. This was not so difficult to separate, but very soft tumor, suckable. 
and then at, at the end we can remove almost the whole tumor from the transnasal transplantum approach. So we have from uh, endoscopic view, you can see the corpus callosum and all the pericalosa, callosum marginal in the interhemispheric space the, from a transnasal approach. So this patient, we could solve his problem only with one stage surgery transnasal. And these are the MRI postoperative. This is fat. If we filled with uh, fat, fascia, and flat, we call the 3F technique. And this is also an uh, invasive tumor, uh, grade E from uh, lateral extension. We always say this uh, old video, but well, the first one, we use a transplant approach for PTD tumor, and we said to the patient, uh, okay, we go transnasal. If the tumor is soft, then we extend the approach and go a transplantum approach, trans tubercular transplantum, and that's what happened. Uh, this is the cellular tumor. The intracellular tumor was very soft. So after removing the cellular portion, we extended the approach for a transplantum, and we, we could see and remove the tumor from the supracellular uh, system. As you can see here, the optic nerve, the superior professor artery, there were two more lateral to the superior hypophysar artery, but very slowly we could remove this tumor. As you can see here, preserve the artery. And at the very end, we were able to see even the temporal lobe from a 45 degree endoscope from the transnasal approach and uh, closing with fat, fascia, and flat. And this is the positive CT, was a non function tumor. We have seen already, we have almost more than 10 years of follow up without recurring. When the uh, invasion is, for, is to the cavernous sinus, uh, is very interesting because uh, the tumor goes to the cavernal sinus and this is an atomic view, it's not what we see in the surgery because the tumor push and displace the nerves laterally. So we have space in the lateral space of the cavernal sinus, lateral carotid artery, to work and remove the tumor. As you can see in those pictures, this is the carotid artery, this is the medial of cavernal sinus, and this is the sixth nerve, and this is a space that the tumor has created. It's possible to remove tumor from lateral to the carotid artery. It's the same thing, cyst nerve and carotid artery here, up remove all the tumor. The problem is, does it's worth to operate or is better to do radiotherapy in cavernal sinus tumor invasion for secreting tumors? And there are some, some, some papers from uh, radiosurgery we see endocological remission if between 40 and 60 percent, and some papers on surgery, endocological remission are around 47 percent, almost the same result. So, things that we must take and talk to the patient and see what we do. So, our philosophy today is all the secretin P2 teradenomas with invasion of the cavernal sinus. We try to remove, we try to follow tumor, and we try to get into the cavernous sinus to get a more radical removal. And all the recurrent and large non-function non -function pituitary adenoma also with cavernous sinus invasion. How can we get into the cavernous sinus? We can go just follow the tumor path uh, in a transcellular approach, then we we can go in front of carotid artery, we can go behind the carotid artery, and depends on the extension of the tumor, we can go lateral to carotid artery. Or we can go more lateral through a transpterygoid approach, and we can have more lateral space to work in the lateral space of the cavern of sinus. How we decide between one and the other? First, the larger of the lateral extension. The larger lateral extension, more lateral we must go. We must go. And here, 
Also, this uh, sagittal view, we can see how much tumor is in front of the carotid artery. So, if, if we have this view, it's very easy to open this membrane here, and through the passing anterior to the carotid artery, you can go lateral to the carotid artery and posterior. When you don't have the tumor be in front of the carotid artery, this is more difficult. Maybe you, you do a pterygoid approach. These are patients that we told her we would not take with tumor from the cavern, not sinus, probably. We were not, uh, was not what we want in the surgery, but it was very, uh, very soft tumor. And we opened, we removed tumor, and the lateral walls was totally open. And we just follow a very soft tumor. So we could follow lateral to the carotid artery. This is carotid artery. Uh, lateral, anterior, posterior. This is the inferior hypophysal artery. And we could give, have a very radical removal. And this is the sixth nerve laterally displaced. And this is the postoperative MRI. Uh, this is an interesting case because this GH produces in tumor. We, with this lateral extension, grade 3A from the NOSP, and we removed the cellular portion. We saw some small opening in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, and through this opening, we, we follow this open, and you will see that uh, we could, there will be some tumor coming from the cavernous sinus through this small open, we enlarge this open till we get some bleeding from cavernal sinus. And this patient from GH from 14 comes from GH of 0.7 after this surgery is still, till now, after two years, under remission. Uh, this male with a silent ACTH tumor, Recuhen, we always try to go medial and lateral, but sometimes we are not able. This is a recurrent tumor. And we, you see that in the, we found the carotid artery. We remove tumor medial to the medial wall, medial to the carotid artery. But you can see there's a lot of adherence and fibrous tissue around the carotid artery. So we had to stop the surgery and say, we don't go lateral to carotid artery. The consistence of the tumor or the fibros, postoperative fibros, normally are patients with recurrent tumors, is very important. The transpterygoid approach is more invasive uh, when we call about the function of the nose. You must do a homolateral maxillectomy, removal of middle turbinate, coagulate the sphenopalatine arterias, and use the contralateral nasal flap. And the center of the field is not anymore the pituitary bus is the carotid artery in median nerve. This is an example of the patient with a non nonfunction pituitary adenoma with large extension of the cavernous sinus. So this is the transpterygoid approach. This is maxillectomy on lateral, same side, coagulation of the pterygoid arteries. So we have lateral space, as you can see here. This is midline, and this is lateral uh, the cavernous sinus lateral uh, to the pituitary gland. First, we remove tumor from the medial part, and then we open the lateral parts very safely because we have seen that there is no, that the tumor is in front of carotid artery, and the carotid artery is pushed posteriorly, very soft tumor. So very uh, gently, we try to remove, dissect, and aspirate the tumor, as much as possible. Of course, we can say uh, there is not a mic, uh, it's a gross total removal, but there's some microscopic disease. And at the end, this is the middle part. And at the end, what we see is the carotid artery, six nerve lateral displaced, and uh, without, uh, we see a gross total removal of the tumor. There are some cases that the tumor by classification, doesn't go into the cavernous sign. There's not invasion of the cavernous signs. And this is a recurrent prolactinome and resistant to cabergoline. And you see there's the pituitary gland. And we came here and the tumor is lateral. It's just attached near the carotid artery. 
And what we see here is the tumor was just adherent and attached to the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. Not into the cavernous sinus, but attached to the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. So we had to remove the tumor and the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, as you can see here. And we see the dorsal cellar posterior, and this is a intercavernous carotid artery here. This is a final view, a very radical removal. So uh, the tumor did not go into the cavernous sinus, but we had to remove the medial wall. And this is the result, prolactin after the surgery, um, without any medication. Almost the same case, but Cushing, this is a patient was operated with Cushing, uh, with remission for six months after six months, clinical recurrence, but without any MRI uh, sign of tumor. Then we wait almost one year, then after one year, we could see the tumor almost the same, very close to the carotid artery, not inside the cavernous sinus. And this, we have done the same approach, take the tumor, a very lateral approach, very lateral, wide open of the cella, and the fibrous tissue with tumor, and this is the, the gland. So you try to find a plan between the gland and the tumor. And here the dorsal cella and open of the cavernous sinus, this is carotid artery, and remove as much as possible all the dura, not only the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, but as much as possible the dura uh, in front of the carotid artery. This, this is the patient after the surgery with normal cortisol, midnight salivar cortisol. She had a transitory six nerve palsy for about two or three weeks, probably due to spongostin that we use of a high pressure we put in the cavernous sinus to stop the bleeding. And those are the, those both patients were almost with the same final view uh, of the removal of a medial wall of the carotid cavernous sinus. Medial wall of, of cavernous sinus. And Nagata has shown that almost 60% of the patients, especially recurrent tumors, have infiltration of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. Another special page, uh, case with tumors that go into the cavernous sinus, invasive tumor, are those tumors that come uh, uh, to the cavernous sinus and get out of the cavernous sinus in intradural space through the oculomotor triangle at this patient, also a recurrent tumor, no secretin. And as you can see, a transplantal approach here. We see the diaphragm cell, optic nerve, and the tumor, extension of the tumor in the intradural space. And we could see some nerve fibers here, very adherent to the, very adherent to the tumor capsule. So we decide to debug the tumor. Debug the tumor. And after the book, and turn the tumor and remove all the upper part of the tumor, of the tumor capsule. But we left some tumor capsule adherent to some small nerve fibers, as you can see here. And this is the third nerve with, two, with tumor capsule. And the patient, of course, uh, developed a third nerve palsy after surgery. And this is the postoperative MRI. And this is a patient after one year have an almost total recovery of the third nerve in the horizontal gaze. So it's long this to go further and radical removal. After one year, he had almost a normal third nerve palsy. And this is described by uh, Juan Miranda uh, in this nice paper that said those tumors that come through the oculomotor triangle from in the cavernous sinus. And then we come back to the paper of Kawasa that showed this tiny membrane in the oculomotor uh, part of uh, the limits of oculomotor nerve and the cavernous sinus uh, where the tumor gets into this triangle. Some pitfalls. So we said every secreting tumors that go into the cavernous sinus, we try to remove, but we cannot remove in all of them. This is a, a recurrent macroprolactinoma resistant to cavernous 
uh, we said, told the patient, we try to remove as much as possible, then do radiotherapy. But the tumor was very uh, vascular, very hard tumor. We could remove only the medial part of the tumor. So we didn't get any advantage of the patient for this surgery. And also, when we try to go more radical and uh, remove more radical tumor, we take more risks. And this using bad instruments, not appropriate instruments, we can have some terrible complications. It's like this carotid artery injury because of this coarse diamond trying to go very lateral to expose the tumor in the cavernous sinus. So in conclusion, about invasive pituitary adenomas, we can say that from a radiological point of view, Hardy grade 3 and 4, Knoss grade 3 and 4, Wilson grade D and E for superior, inferior, and lateral extension. From a histological point of view, dura invasion and, and proliferation index to, to, to say about invasion. And from a surgical point of view, in uh, our philosophy is try to remove all the non-prolactinin secreting tumor or prolactinin, prolactinoma secreting tumor, invading the cavernous sinus, large non-secreting tumor. Uh, we think that transnasal endoscopic surgery is more effective than the microscopic. We use transplanal, transcellular, or transpterygoid approach. Those three approach depends on the tumor extension. And tumor consistency is the most uh, uh, plays a biggest hold on how if you are going to get a radical removal or not. We need more data to compare uh, cavernous sinus removal, surgical, and with radiotherapy or radiotherapy alone. And but we are we, we are sure that we combine treatment is always more effective for those patients. Thank you for your attention, and we can discuss. Eduardo, I think this was a spectacular lecture, really beautiful, and I'm sure everybody in the audience uh, enjoyed it, and those who are not with us today will be hearing the recorded versions as has been in previous sessions. Thank you. I appreciate very much the effort in putting this lecture together. Um, I'd like to invite Roy. Roy Cassiano, my rhinology colleague, to teach us how his preference, what his preference is about rebuilding the floor of the cella and the anterior skull base after uh, it gets destroyed. There we go. Let me unblock my mute. Hello, everybody. Thank you. This has uh, been a very... Uh, informative session, especially for an ENT doctor to listen to his colleagues in a kind of a nice formal setting like this. Nowadays with COVID, it's very unusual for us to meet, but when we do, it's great to share this knowledge. Uh, just uh, in less than 10 minutes, I, uh, uh, Jock wanted me to uh, review a little bit about our technique, specifically at UM, and it's a pretty uh, unique technique, uh, just uh, in, and I'll go into it in a second. <clears throat> this is, you know, it, it was said that it's important for, for institutions to do these type of surgeries to review their results, uh, not only because of what kind of surgical ish, uh, complications you have, but also medical complications. This is just one of our last series that we did uh, through 2012 and 18, looking at at a, a number of patients who underwent pituitary surgery. And we can see that, uh, and we were looking specifically at readmission rates. Uh, and uh, we're looking at both the surgical readmissions and medical and the reasons why. Um, and, and, and Dr. Karji will talk a little bit about the medical issues, one of the most common medical issues. But you can see that we had a total of all, we had about a 14% readmission rate. It's, it's important to know this number. Uh, and between the medical and surgical, you see the medical reasons were a little higher than the surgical reasons for readmission. And hyponatremia was actually one of the highest reasons medically for readmission, whereas CSF leak repair was at 3.4. Now, this number hasn't really changed much in the over 20-some years that we've done 
uh, surgery together with uh, uh, Jock and myself. And uh, but I will uh, review some of our techniques uh, and some of the pitfalls and pearls that we've learned over the years. <clears throat> so here is a technique that we use uh, and have been using. Of, of notice, uh, this was one of our last article that we published in 2013, but the technique hasn't changed and really our results haven't, been, have, haven't changed either. Uh, uh, in, in general, uh, it's still staying well around 3% uh, uh, CSF leak rates requiring admission. Uh, uh, we do not put lumbar drains in any of our patients. So what you're seeing here in the actual re uh, results as far as CSF leak uh, basically represents patients that we've operated without lumbar drains, we've sent home and then they'd had a post-operative leak somewhere in the, in the first few weeks after surgery uh, for the most part. So the, the, the repair that we've done is basically a one layer uh, acellular dermis. Uh, before acellular dermis was available uh, in, the, in the 90s when we started doing a lot of the anterior ventral skull based resections for esthesials and other, other type of tumors, uh, we still did a very similar repair. At the time we had our tissue bank and we were using our uh, freeze-dried dura availability. It, uh, the freeze-dried dura was okay after you rehydrated it, but um, we found that when the acellular dermis products uh, came into play uh, in the late 90s, uh, that it was easier to reform and reshape the acellular dermis to the surrounding irregular bony structures that you can adhere them better. And so, but the technique is, is still the same where we had in the case of the pituitary, we have an inlay portion of the grass of the graft. Uh, and then we have an uh, onlay portion, which is the part that is probably the most important part, which is this bony edge right here, where you've got to make that real tight wrap around the corner so you don't have CSF going through it. So to do that, you've got to have a way of pushing that elderm inward a little bit where the tumor was, uh, not to overfill it, but enough to create enough pressure in the pocket where then you can just put on your gel foam over the onlay portion inside the nose, inside the sphenoid circumferentially on the bone. And then you put gel foam and then followed by a Maricel tampon. We've never used balloons because that is very painful and ulcerative to the nose. We've used Maricels most of the years we've been around doing this uh, that fills the space. It also, again, molds to the irregularities of that common cavity. So basically, as we put the alloderm, the, the size of the alloderm, and I'm showing a, this video specifically for a reason, I'll tell you in a second, but the size of the alloderm graph should be at least two times the circumference of the bony uh, uh, defect uh, from one side to the other, at least two times the size. Uh, so uh, the problem is in a case like this, which had a very small CSF leak, you can get away with a little smaller. Uh, you, you can see the, the, the concept is the same. You pucker it up, you push in the, these little uh, plugets that we create that I'll show you in a minute that act like a little mini tampon inside where the tumor was pushing the the, uh, the, uh, the acellular dermis within the cella, and then you wrap the edges, make sure you have enough of an edge around it that you can wrap an, on its own onto the bone circumferentially. So you systematically have to go around pushing on the edge all the way around to make sure there's no dead space and that you have acellular dermis touching the bone. And then of course you put the gel foam, uh, you can compress the gel foam with a, a cottonoid, and then you put in the uh, uh, tampon. The other thing is when you insert the tampon here, you try to only insert it uh, where it's touching the gel foam and then you uh, put water on it to hydrate it and then you push it in the rest of the way uh, like an accordion so it takes up the shape of the uh, cavity. Uh, we uh, refrain from pushing that alloderm while it's still hard up against the alloderm, it can displace both the alloderm and the graft. So once it's just barely touching the alloderm or the, uh, the gel foam that's protecting the alloderm, then we hydrate it and we push the rest of the uh, Maricel in there. And we take that out within 10 days to two weeks after surgery. 
So these are the little, we wrap some surges cell around dry gel foam and just moisten it on the fingers to create these little cigarettes that we cut into little cylinders. Generally, you only need, and these cylinders are cut in about a centimeter size at, at most. And, uh, and, and, and these are what we place inside, as you see here on the, on the graphics, inside here. Generally, you only need one and at best two cylinders. The, the key here is if you are doing the same similar repair for a, uh, uh, where you got a high flow leak and you see the third ventricle, the optic chiasm, not to overpack this so it doesn't migrate superiorly and put pressure on the optic chiasm. So you have to be very careful how much you put in there. As long as you got this wrap around the edge of the bone, that's all you need. You need the pressure around the edge. This is the most important part. This key part is the pressure around the bone here and killing the dead space. Uh, so this is another uh, case here where we've finished uh, removal of the tumor. We put in the acellular dermis. We redrape it. We like to have it so the dermal side, the uh, punctated red side, is down towards the towards the pituitary. And then we uh, put in our cylinder, uh, one or two cylinders, again, just to fill in where the tumor was. And then we compress it with a cottonoid. And then we make sure that we've redraped all circumferentially against bones. So there's no dead space in this area. Once we know there's no dead space, then we go ahead and place our gel foam. We uh, compress it again uh, to make sure again that there's no dead space. And then we put our Maricel to fill the cavity. We hydrated it and then we push it in to take the form of this uh, cavity, uh, the internal part of the cavity. It does not fill the nasal cavity. It only fills the common sphenoid. So when do we use a flap? Because that always comes up. I know some of my colleagues around the country and their neurosurgeons like to routinely use flaps for even for routine cellas. We'd like to save it for a rainy day if we really do need it uh, and not overuse it on, on these patients. Uh, it, it, just a little uh, side. This is a, uh, a, an article from 1989 a year after I finished my residency. And in those days, they were doing reconstruction of rhinectomy areas uh, with uh, a nasal septal flap where they would line the internal lining of the external nose as they reconstructed the, sub, the cartilaginous subunits of the nose with cartilage from elsewhere. But this is nothing new. The septal flap's been around for ages, at least since the 80s, early 80s. Uh, but what is new is that we've been able to adapt this to repair the skull base. So. Uh, this is one of the areas, if you've, again, if you have a high flow leak, I think that's made a big difference for us. And looking our, and this is a little old uh, information now, but we noticed in an old uh, review of our numbers that, and even nationally, you see literature that range from 50, 15 to 40% CSF leak in these high uh, flow leaks. And then in most uh, evidence out there, they've been able to decrease this to low uh, single digits. Uh, with the added addition of the flap. For us, it's still the same reconstruction with the uh, ACL or dermis. The only difference is that before we put the gel foam in place, we place the flap above it, and then we put the gel foam. So here we've done the, the alloderm reconstruction, high flow leak. We try not to over compress it up towards the optic chiasm. We redrape everything circumferentially, and then we go ahead and rotate a flap around it, uh, and, and we again, it's killing the dead space is very important. Another case here where we've uh, basically have the optic chiasm. Uh, you would think this is one of these cases where you'd be avoid uh, doing uh, uh, anything that may compress this. Uh, people would put fat uh, first. We sometimes will do that. We didn't in this particular case. Uh, just a little note, when you have these big defects, it's important to over, overestimate the size of this, this type of graft because you're going to have to really have a, a, lot, a lot of bone against uh, alloderm apposition intranasally in the sphenoid, uh, more so than a smaller defect. So you need to overestimate, redrape everything, uh, and make sure that when you put your little plugs in that you don't overplug it high up into the, uh, uh, up against the uh, optic chiasm. Over time, that kind of resorbs and the graph will shift downward uh, as it heals and it granulates in place. But here we're just putting the first plug. We put a couple plugs in this particular case um, and 
and then uh, we would go ahead and put the second plug. We redrape the sides, and at this point, we would go ahead and place the flap right above it, which is basically what we did. At this point, these are the post-op views here, and you can actually see the flap uh, on the sagittal plane. You can see a little flap uh, uh, on, the, on the floor of the, of the common sphenoid. So in, in summary, uh, just some pearls uh, for a larger anterior skull base or low flow defect that graft really is all that is necessary as long as you adhere to the fundamentals of, of closure. Uh, and that includes killing uh, dead space, make sure you have graft to bone apposition uh, and, and, uh, and make sure that postoperatively you do not debride the grafted area. You let that fall off. We give our patients irrigation with saline irrigation starting uh, a week after they've been, uh, they've seen us uh, for uh, Maricel removal. The only reason we don't start it immediately after Maricel removal is to detect if they have a leak. Because some of these patients come in, they start irrigations and immediately they're calling our office that they've got a leak. When in fact, what it is, it's just accumulated saline in the sinuses. So we, we try to hold off uh, doing that. Um, and the goal is again, to separate the, uh, inter, uh, the, to separate the intracranial structures, dura and brain, from the, and create a watertight seal around the edge of the bony defect. That's it. Thanks, Roy. Very clear, I think. Um, thank you very much. Um, again, we, if there are questions, we'll, we'll field them at the end. So now I'd like to invite Atil, Karji, and after that, Alejandro Ayala to talk about endocrinologic issues. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Let me know if otherwise. Yeah, it's very clear, and we hear you well. Great. So I'll be very short. I think I only have about five PowerPoint slides, and I'd like to share my time with um, our other panelists. I'll review um, with you some work we've been doing with a quality improvement project to prevent, identify, and uh, treat hyponatremia and prevent our readmission rates, which you heard a little bit about from Roy already for hyponatremia. And I'll also just mention briefly that you may all realize this already, but pituitary disorders are a very small group of patients in an endocrinology practice, and not all endocrinologists may be experienced with some of the more challenging cases. So it's, I think, important for the neurosurgeons to identify um, endocrinologists in their area who are experienced with uh, these patients. Uh, and so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about perioperative and postoperative steroid and especially sodium management and point out that the glucocorticoid management and also DI and SIADH prevention uh, protocols are very variable among different institutions, even in the United States and around the world. Uh, there are some places that operate on patients without steroid coverage and check cortisol immediately post-operatively on day one and day two and discharge patients. Um, and similarly, there's other places that will send all patients home as we do on physiologic low-dose hydrocortisone and reassess cortisol levels and have uh, uh, the endocrinologist discontinue them uh, within a few weeks after surgery when deemed appropriate. Uh, sodium management is also quite similar. Um, you know, historically, there were times where we wouldn't follow sodium levels very early after surgery, soon after discharge until a, a couple of weeks after surgery. Um, and there are other centers that are much more aggressive and put patients on a fluid restriction, liberalize salt intake and check sodium quite early as an outpatient um, and, and follow up very closely with the patients. There are really no controlled trials comparing the outcomes among these different protocols. And hyponatremia is indeed a frequent cause, if not the most frequent cause of early and delayed readmission. So you're all familiar with this classical triple phase timeline, which has been elaborated upon uh, historically by studies of experimental transection of the pituitary stalk. And what you see here in these red and blue lines on the graph are measurements of urine osmolality and serum sodium, uh, basically as a surrogate of ADH production. So owing to injury, which is often temporary to the, the neurons in the pituitary infundibulum and neurohypothesis, we see an early phase here shown on the left of just a couple of days of diabetes insipidus, followed by a rapid change and a shift here that can last a week or two of SIADH, which can lead to hyponatremia if not intervened upon. And 
This is a very important reason why we don't send patients home, even if they do develop diabetes insipidus inpatient, on standing orders of DDAVP, uh, as it should only be administered if absolutely necessary if patients are having extreme polyuria or polydipsia. Otherwise, the risk of hyponatremia increases. I'll say that this you know, pattern is classically described this way, but those of you who've seen a lot of these patients will notice that this is very variable. And uh, you know, we can see patients who just have one of these uh, phases rather than all three or none of them uh, at, at all. And so there is a little bit of literature, you know, on the top left, a study from Andrew Little's group at the Barrow Neuroscience Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, just describing that delayed hyponatremia is a common cause of readmissions. Um, they found around 8% of patients undergoing transphenoidal surgery were readmitted. And on the top right is a study from England from an endocrinologist well known to us, Ashley Grossman, who tried to identify causes or predictors of who would develop hyponatremia. And there's several papers on this and they have contradictory and inconsistent findings. So I'll show you our data on the last slide, but it's hard to identify true predictors of who will develop hyponatremia after surgery. Certainly the small group of patients who have untreated hypopituitarism, meaning untreated thyroid hormone and cortisol deficiencies are independently known to increase the risk of hyponatremia. Some, but not all studies have described that larger tumors, particularly those such as cranial pharyngiomas involving the stalker or compressing the optic chiasm um, may be associated with a higher risk of postoperative hyponatremia. And lastly, on the bottom left panel is a study representative of a few of others that have come out in the last few years. This one is from the University of Colorado, an endocrinology group, describing their protocol in which they routinely water restricted all patients for the first week after surgery, following their discharge to 1.5 liters daily, together with liberalizing their salt intake and check the post-op day seven sodium level. And what they found was that prior to initiating this protocol, readmission rates for hyponatremia were above 7%, and following this protocol, the readmission rates dropped to 2.4%. So uh, what we analyzed here, and this is the same data set that, that Roy showed us uh, earlier, was de data from 409 patients who underwent transphenoidal surgery at our institution. And hyponatremia was indeed the most common cause of readmission. So a third of patients readmitted were readmitted due to hyponatremia. And you can see the other causes, including the cerebrospinal fluid leak percentages on, on the next line. Patients with hyponatremia were readmitted earlier than others, and this actually gives me pause because the common protocols of checking serum sodium about one week after the date of surgery might fail. As you can see, the, the mean duration to readmission was only four days with this particular problem, and we found this difference to be statistically significant. And among all the factors we analyzed, though there were some trends for predictors for who would be readmitted, the only one that met statistical sig significance was shown here on the bottom line was that patients who had outpatient follow-up with an endocrinologist had about a 50% reduction uh, in their odds of having um, readmission for hyponatremia. So I believe this is my last slide and I'd like to ask some of our other panelists um, uh, who are with us today, our neurosurgical colleagues, to share you know, with us um, what their protocols are. Do, do you operate and send patients home with steroids? Do you fluid restrict people or check a serum sodium at a time interval after surgery? Or what do your endocrinologists usually do? Eduardo, what do you, would you like to comment about uh, your experience with hyponatremia post-op after transfer yes. surgery and how you guys handle it? Yes. Uh, we worked with a uh, very well-known neuroendocrinologist that uh, Julia Bouchon and Marcel Brownstein and Agi knows him. And we have two different philosophies. For instance, for Cushing disease, one of them want to see the patient gets worse in the postoperative period before giving the, the corticosteroid. And the other one, no, give the steroids, a low dose of steroids from the first day, and then slowly after the discharge, we see what happens with the results of the ECTH. Uh, relation to the hyponatremia, all the our patients get a postoperative uh, examination of sodium twice a day and uh, uh, diuresis control. And if the patient is okay, he is he, out of the go home without any treatment, 
um, without any observation, only uh, serum sodium, the seventh postoperative day, and to see if there is a hypo hyponatremia. And that's it. And we see that uh, even if the patient doesn't have a um, diabetic sepsis in the postoperative, diabetic sepsis, he must control the sodium after the seventh postoperative day. Uh, Ma Marvin, any comments on your practice with respect to endocrine issues? Hi. Um, so we, um, we send our patients home on fluid restriction at 1.5 liters a day. Um, we actually give them soft salt tabs. Uh, we do not send them home on steroids uh, routinely unless they're they require it for, for clinical reasons. And, and we do try to get a sodium in seven days. So um, we, we follow that protocol. Okay. Apio, anything to add from your perspective on that? I may have lost him for a second. Um, I, okay. Uh, 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 Atim, shall we move on to Alex? Or you want to make any other comments? Um, no, I'll just, you know, um, emphasize what uh, Dr. Bellatini said is that, you know, all of what we're discussing here is for patients without um, Cushing's disease. Those patients we too operate without steroid coverage um, because of the unique ability to measure postoperative cortisol as an indicator of remission. Um, and one other point about the study I showed from Colorado was that uh, their, their protocol was only for patients who didn't develop, you know, early post-op DI. So they didn't include them in their data set for for water restriction um, following surgery. Yeah. Okay, could, could I just ask, uh, your data shows uh, a mean of four days from discharge because almost all the studies, including our data, shows eight days post-operatively is the mean time for hypovitremia. Um, is your length of stay four days and then you have plus four days after discharge or because it's really uncommon to see hyponatremia on post-op day number four. Right. Yeah, you know, no, this, length of stay is 48 hours, uh, Marvin, uh, here in our practice. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Atil. Yeah, no, no, I mean, my understanding from the data is that it's um, post-operative, um, but I, I will review that <laughs> to make sure that it's not days following discharge. Certainly that okay. doesn't make sense. Yeah, because th there was a really interesting study out of Germany where they kept their patients in the hospital for, I forget, two weeks and measured all these... and. It was eight days uh, in, in, that, in that study as well, where they yeah. prospectively yeah. looked at this. And, and what people find hospital. is, you know, the prevalence of hyponatremia actually, or the frequency is up to 25% of patients. So these are readmission rates. But if you start checking the sodium, you're going to find very mild asymptomatic hyponatremia in a greater number of patients. Sure. And, and, and to your point, in terms of how worthwhile it is, we've had patients with normal sodium on day seven, and then profoundly hyponatremic on day eight. So it, it is also not necessarily reassuring if it's normal. Great. Um, Alex? Yeah. I'm going to well, share the screen here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see here. OK. Uh, First of all, thank you so much. I want to uh, thank, uh, well, welcome our international and national uh, panelists and everybody who is here. And also thank Dr. Morcos and the cerebrovascular and skull team for the invitation. Uh, I want to share one of our recent cases. It's a little bit of a different approach, just to make it a little bit more interesting, since Atil was going to talk about uh, hyponatremia. This is a case we saw recently. It's a 34-year-old uh, female with no, pan, pa, uh, no past medical history, and she did have double vision, headaches, and no evidence of excess production of hormones, essentially. Um, but because of this, in our right cranial nerve 6, uh, she had an MRI that revealed basically this uh, uh, expanded uh, cellar mass or ex uh, expanded cella with a cellar mass that was thick walled and had internal T2 signaling and um, it extended into the sphenoid sinuses with abutment of the bilateral cavernous sinuses. Um, so you can see it there laterally and the hormonal evaluation was really unremarkable as you can see here. Um, you know, the patient did not have adrenal insufficiency. It didn't sound like uh, she had uh, other uh, 
uh, over secretion syndromes like acromegaly. Uh, she did have surgery. Uh, you know, the patient was operated with transgenoidal approach with uh, gross uh, total resection of the cellular mass. She did not develop diabetes insipidus. And uh, just going in this, I know all of you know this, but this is just to remind us of what's the differential diagnosis of those more commonly pituitary adenomas and, and cranial pharyngiomas and rapid flap cysts. Um, in uh, our case, what seemed to be happening is that this was a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma, and the immunohistochemistry really ruled out uh, lung adenocarcinoma, which, as you know, it's very frequent, uh, breast cancer, um, and, uh, you know, uh, urothelial carcinoma, so, and also hepatocellular carcinoma. So we we're a little bit perplexed. We didn't know where this was coming from. Uh, a, a PET scan, a whole body PET scan, revealed this large hypermetabolic necrotic mass in the right hepatic globe. And, uh, you know, we were thinking, of course, this is uh, the cause of her um, metastatic disease to the pituitary gland. And this is just to remind you uh, that uh, it, it was Ludwig Benjamin and then subsequently Harvey Cushing in 1930 who described uh, pituitary metastases. And they're rare. Well, there are about 300 cases in the literature at least until 2018 from the review we did. So it represents approximately 1% of cellular masses and breast cancer being the most common one, lung pretty common. And visual symptoms are the most common primary manifestation. Um, you know, the, the uh, posterior pituitary, uh, the posterior part of the pituitary seems to be more uh, susceptible. And uh, frequently we see diabetes insipidus, the median survival is not that good. This just shows the same information, uh, breast cancer, lung cancer, thyroid, and um, in colon here, uh, but you know uh, this again is from 1957 to 2018, so you can see the cases here. Um, what uh, these are the most common symptoms? Our patient has visual involvement and uh, did not have any form of pituitary insufficiency, which called our attention, but uh, we we did look carefully into that. So uh, uh, next generation sequencing was performed in this case. And this is what sort of I want to bring to the table because it's been used uh, to basically try to classify and diagnose new mutations that I think ultimately will uh, sort of reclassify how pituitary tumors are uh, or, or how we look at pituitary tumors. And the interpretation was that this patient had an, FG, uh, an FGR, FGF receptor 2 mutation or it's really a, mu a gene fusion that was detected with the BI uh, uh, one, CC1 gene. And um, this mutation uh, is uh, rare, and it's, uh, or, or this fusion, gene fusion, is rare and has been reported in a molecular subtype of uh, co uh, cholangiocarcinoma. We think this is the first uh, case reported in the literature of metastatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma to the pituitary gland. And it show, sort of showcases uh, how next generation sequencing will be used uh, in future years. It's already been used, and this is just uh, to show you uh, or to remind you of how it has been used. In the old days, the Sanger sequencing studies, pragmatically for obvious reasons, uh, looked at uh, syndromic uh, pituitary tumors such as uh, uh, McCune Albright or NMN1, NMN4, Carnish complex, and these are the genes that we know are, were already described that cause pituitary tumors in a familiar form or in a syndromic form. Now, uh, lately, next generation sequencing uh, has given uh, us clues of the pathophysiology of Cushing syndrome. One of the first mutations that was reported was uh, by a, a group in Germany, it was the USP8 mutation the tables one mutation, um, and then a BRAF in papillary craniopharyngiomas, CKNNB1 in craniopharyngiomas, Dyson syndrome, and CDH23 uh, mutations in familiar uh, pituitary adenomas. Uh, so, so basically, I think this case you know, shows how uh, next generation sequencing could be used also for uh, not only metastatic disease, but to reclassify these tumors. And perhaps they may give us some insight into the uh, potential behavior of these tumors that can in turn uh, guide uh, surgery. The liver biopsy here uh, showed a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma consistency with, consistent with cholangiocarcinoma. And the patient basically received um, uh, palliative treatment with chemotherapy. 
Very rare indeed, yes, very interesting. Thank you. Nice uh, to remind people of zebras when not everything looks like horses. Yeah, yeah I think also pretty much where sort of genetic testing is leading in terms uh, to the diagnosis and classification of, uh, of these tumors. Right, right. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Arvin, let me invite you to share your slides and unmute your microphone and um, and we thank you, can, thank you Jacques. And, uh, show, uh, obviously, you know, perhaps you could ask Eduardo after you show the case how he would handle it. I think uh, Nelson may have gone back to the OR uh, okay. and maybe up. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, oh you're here. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I, I'm still listening. Okay. okay. And Jacques, thank you so much for inviting me to be on the panel. And I'm just curious, you mentioned zebras. I wonder if in different parts of the world they talk about horses. <laughs> you're right. So um, if I could just share this case, uh, and this is in line, uh, I, I know that Nelson was speaking and Eduardo was speaking, so I wanted to find a case that maybe bridged both, uh, both uh, excellent talks. Thank you so much, I, so very informative. So this uh, pretty straightforward history, a 55-year-old female, uh, had many, many features of acromegaly. Um, interestingly, a paternal uncle well, was almost seven feet tall, or, uh, and her patient was five foot eight, but uh, it does give you a hint that maybe there's something um, uh, of a familial uh, tendency there. This was her laboratory evaluation, and I just want to uh, point to you the uh, mildly elevated prolactin, but the pretty moderately elevated growth hormone and clear evidence of, of acromyology. So again, pretty straightforward. Um, and if we look at the tumor here, uh, the prolactin elevation may be sock effect or uh, maybe a, uh, a, a combined secretor. But the big question here, and what I, uh, Jacques asked us to, uh, to present controversial cases. So what I counsel my patients uh, is that surgical uh, intervention for functional tumors, the, the primary indication is cure. Uh, removing part of the tumor uh, they, end, they still end up on medical treatment or radiation, and there, there may be some uh, uh, beneficial effects with cytoreduction in terms of lower medication doses or uh, preferred uh, or, or better radiosurgical targets, but for the most part, it's surgical cure. Um, Eduardo showed two recurrent tumors uh, with uh, medial wall cavernous sinus involvement, and um, you know, the, the experience with at Oldfield with Cushing's disease really documents that recurrence is nearly always in the cavernous sinus uh, area with Cushing's disease. And a very, very nice study uh, out of Pittsburgh from two years ago, uh, Cohen Cohen uh, study, they took 50 patients and every patient, they, they took the medial wall, the cavernous sinus and showed that in functional tumors, 83% of them had invasion of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. So uh, the, the, the question here is, given this MRI scan, would you counsel the patient in this case who has acromegaly, should we resect the medial wall of the cavernous sinus electively on her first operation? Eduardo, would you do it? Uh, good question. But uh, in our experience, this infiltration of the cavernous sinus uh, medial wall is more frequent in recurrence tumors. So in the first surgery, we'll see what's going on. We, we can see, you can remove tumor and see how is the relationship with the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. And most of the time for the first surgery, you don't see some infiltration. Maybe you can leave some residual tumor cells, but in the first time, electively, I would not propose I'm going to, re to remove the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, because yes. most of the time, we don't need to do it in the first surgery. Nelson, how, how, what would you counsel the patient? Uh, Marvin, I would counsel the patient that 
Um, I would not recommend doing a medial wall resection at the first go around. I think in this case, there's a very strong likelihood that the lesion may still respect the pituitary capsule, even though it's a NOPS2. Um, and um, the chances are that if you preserve that pituitary gland capsule, that inner layer of dura <clears throat> and don't breach the gland itself, that this indentation of the medial wall by the tumor uh, is not an invasion. It's an indentation and a compression. Um, and if you respect that gland capsule, um, you can, in many cases, preserve that and remove the tumor. So I would not go for the, the uh, more extended approach unless at surgery, uh, I saw a clear evidence that it had breached the wall, in which case then obviously you either have to do that or at that point because you're not going to be able to do, uh, you're not going to get 100% without doing that. Yeah, no, I think that those are all wise. <laughs> okay, so I, I have to say though that uh, based on that Pittsburgh study where these were not, these were cases where there was not a clear invasion on MRI or intraoperatively. These were pathological cases where they show invasion in a very high percentage of cases that have that are laterally aspect tumors. Um, and, the, and also we know that the long-term recurrence rate uh, uh, data uh, isn't very good. It's, it's you know, 20 to 30 percent or more uh, cases. So here, here's her case. And so here's what I did. I, I, I did counsel the patient that I was going to uh, do so. And um, so uh, here's just, uh, this is double speed here. I don't, I don't operate this fast. Uh, just didn't want the video to be that long. So found that pseudocapsule. Uh, it's pseudocapsule is nice. So you can literally grab it and pull on it and find that plane. And you just keep coming around to maintain the normal pituitary gland. And um, I use sharp bisection. Superiorly, this tumor came very high. And there was a small CSF leak um, that was encountered and kept coming around and actually had a very nice plane here. You can see the medial wall, the cavernous sinus there. It looked clean um, and uh, removed the tumor, but you can see the medial wall there. Uh, this, this derb looked a little ratty superiorly. So I, I resected that as well, but uh, here I'm using ultrasound to confirm where the carotid artery is not and opening up the, the inferiorly first and just starting to do this dissection here to, to enter the cavernous sinus inferiorly and there's a little nubbin of tumor down there. Uh, you can see there the cavernous sinus, there's the carotid artery. Uh, and there's the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, which is now just resected sharply. Uh, remove that anterior dura uh, as well to remove that tumor. I couldn't quite get enough access, so I had to drill more bone uh, inferiorly uh, to, to get at that inferior portion. You can see there the, the venous bleeding from the cavernous sinus. And finally, the uh, resection of the mass. So this is a case here where the, the radio, radiology and even the intraoperative findings uh, were not very suggestive of cavernous sinus invasion, but the, uh, 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 the I, I chose to do this again. I, I, I counsel all my patients that I, I take the Omusiku uh, view that the first case is the best time to get a cure. Uh, and here's a flap. And here's the balloon that we use to hold that basal septal flap uh, for cases that are superiorly where we really cannot get a, a good purchase. Um, you can see the uh, uh, interface here of tumor in, in the that cavernous sinus and staying positive for uh, growth hormone. And uh, she actually was not adherent to fluid restriction and came back with hyponatremia, but she's doing well. And her postoperative growth hormone was. 0.7 and eight months, 0.1, and they're with normal IGF-1 values. So um, just thought you might be interested how we do it. We do take a pretty aggressive uh, stance and, and routinely resect medial wall cavernous sinus and, and 
Cushing's, prolactinomas, and acromegalics, if the tumor goes laterally. The, nice the case, Mark. Comment? May I, may I ask you, uh, Jack, uh, uh, the problem is uh, we don't have such a uh, clinical parallel between those pathological examinations and the, the clinical course of the of the patients so sometimes you can see invasion in the in the microscope in the laboratory and but the follow and the clinical uh, course of the patient doesn't is, is different and otherwise if, if if the tumor is just uh is not invaded the, the media wall is just uh on the media wall and you see there is no infiltration uh, and you see, and you say that you must remove because the tumor is, uh, is very closed. You must remove all the dura, the anterior dura, the inferior dura. This is has some contact with the tumor also. You see, this this would be a radical removal of the, all the dura. This is in contact. The medial wall, anterior dura, and inferior dura. This is contact with the tumor also, in order to avoid the recurrence. Uh, we do we do remove the inferior dura as well. Um, yeah. So it must be a, not only the lateral wall, the medial okay. wall, but only all the dura. But I, I think, think the presumption is that the medial wall of the cavernous sinus is because there is a hidden chamber behind it, unlike the other. I see your points, Eduardo, but I mean that's the presumption: is there is potential space behind it where. As he showed in his video, very he would have missed a small piece, correct, uh, Marvin, on the uh, other yeah. side. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. I have a question for Dr. Burke Snyder. That's okay. Um, so, when you're faced with cases like this with acromegaly with an invasive somatotrope adenoma, especially into the cavernous sinus, do you consider pretreatment with somato with somatostatin analogs to shrink the tumor to make it more easily resectable or curable? So it's a great, great question. Um, so again, I, I didn't think preoperatively that this patient had an invasive tumor. I, I completely agree with the, the other surgeons here that th it looked like it was just impinging or pushing on the wall and didn't expect necessarily to find this. So um, I, I have a pretty simple approach. If they're clearly invasive, they actually go to medical treatment because in my uh, long-term response rate to cav gross cavernous sinus invasion is very low durability on remission. Um, so we actually give them a trial actually for permanent treatment, not just, uh, I, I haven't found much utilization or utility of, uh, I guess utility of shrinking it down before surgery. If the horse has already left the barn and is, uh, medication is not gonna bring that horse back into the cell. Or zebra, I'm sorry. I forgot which part of the world I'm in. Mean, yes. It's okay, we're international. We'll take okay. all comers. <laughs> Great case. Apio, uh, can, I, can I get you to yeah. share your slide and unmute your microphone? And after Apio presents his case, perhaps I can ask Carolina Benjamin, my partner, to you know, comment and perhaps field some of the questions from the audience. Well, is that okay? Uh, yeah, but put it in presentation mode, yeah. Okay, well, Jack, thank you for the invitation. And uh, well, I live in the south of Brazil. This is my university hospital, which are, we, we, as I just recently noticed that our colleague has been here uh, some years ago, the endocrine, your friend of mine. So um, Porto Alegre, as you know, in the south of the country, I'm very proud to be here because as you can see in these pictures, in the pituitary meetings and skull-based meetings, we met together with Nelson and, and Jax. Uh, this case I'm gonna show you is a very common case of big tumor, but there are two points for the discussion that I want to tell you uh, according to 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 hear what we what would you do? This is a 59 year old male of nine years history of headaches and progressive 
loss of vision. This patient was hypertensive, obese, had bilateral glaucoma and diabetes. The endocrine people have seen him and said that he's had hypogonadic and central hypothyroidism. He was put on prednisone and cabergoline, uh, as you see. We sent the patient at the outpatient clinic. The patient was blind of the left eye with severe loss of vision of the right eye. And this was the visual field on the good eye, if you, you can say good eye. And this was the case. Uh, I would like to hear from the panel, what would they do with this case? Considering two points. First, just to advance the, the discussion. This was a hard, very hard tumor. And the patient had only one eye. And he said, definitely, I won't accept any at all uh, empiration of my vision of the right eye. So we had two problems, a heart tumor and uh, only one eye working and the patient wouldn't accept any change at all. So please, all the neurosurgeons and the endocrine people, what, they, what do you do with this case? And I show you what I have done later. Uh, before the answer, Apio, what do you mean heart tumor? You mean based on MRI, you thought? No, no, based on my operation. Oh, 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 I see. I can oh. tell you. Right, Just right. To, because if it was a, a you know, it was not a heart tumor, it was an easy task for you to take this tumor out. I and this was a non secreting heart tumor, and the patient wouldn't accept any change in his only eye vision. Be, maybe perhaps before the neurosurgeons on the panel answer, maybe I can open it up first to our endocrinologist and take this opportunity to ask them is there any medical? any appropriate medical treatment for non-functioning pituitary adenomas, uh, Atil and uh, Alex? I'll defer to Alex. Okay. Not really. Uh, my answer is not really. Uh, I, I think that there are, there are a few, I mean, there are a few things that can perhaps, like even the somatostatin analogs could decrease the size, uh, you know, of, of, you know, 20%, you know, of non-functioning adenomas, but for this type of tumor, I, I, you know, I, I don't think okay. it's, it's I, I just wanted the audience to kind of, the young people in the audience to, 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 to hear that clearly. I, feel, okay. I don't know if you opine differently. Yeah, you know, I think there's some retrospective reviews showing about a 10%, you know, response rate with somatostatin analogs and some studies from Israel I've seen using dopamine agonists, but they're not, you know, you need a dramatic response, you know, so if this is a prolactinoma, yes, you know, we see dramatic responses with cabergoline, but for non-functioning tumors. Another thought is that, you know, for pituitary carcinomas and aggressive tumors, sometimes temozolomide has been used by our neuro-oncology colleagues with great success. And so we usually don't prescribe that as the endocrinologist, but it, it could be considered. Uh, maybe, shall we ask Eduardo, since he was the invasive pituitary lecturer today, <laughs> how he would yes. handle this? Yes, uh, for very giant, large pituitary adenomas, uh, of course, you, can, you could do a transnasal approach if you, in forehead, you know if the tumor is soft, or at least you have some indication through the MRI, with T2 MRI, if the tumor is soft. Because the problem with those large tumors is you go from a, uh, so a transnasal approach, you, the tumor is hard, you remove part of the tumor, and there is a high risk of bleeding in the postoperative period. And as in this patient, in these patients, the purpose, the main purpose of the surgery is optic nerve, optic chiasma, decompress optical, uh, optic chiasma, optical nerve. Uh, and if the tumor is hard or in T2 uh, seems to be a hard tumor, I'd go a transcranial approach from the left side where the tumor is on the left side, the, the, the worst vision on the left side, and decompress the optic pathway. This would be my, my for these patients, what I do.
N Nelson, are you with us? Yeah. Hi, Jack. Hey. Um, is this a good transphenoidal case in Emory or it's a transcranial case? No, it's not a good, you know, it, it's got some strikes against it for the uh, transphenoidal. Um, it's a shallow cellar. Um, so that's one. Number two, it's multi-compartmental. Um, you know, it's breached the, it looks like it's breached the arachnoid at least in one, one area, if not two. And there's some uncertainty as to, I can't tell, maybe it will show in some other slices, whether there's any encasement at all of any of the anterior circle, maybe the... I think you can see it at the top left, correct, Apio? That's the ACA, well, 180 degree encasement, isn't it, Apio? Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So it seems to me that there's at least the very likely possibility, just looking at these, that there will be some encasement uh, of that A1 or maybe part of the ACOM complex. But long story short, those all make it more, more hazardous. And if I heard Apio right, he said the tumor was hard. And I don't know whether he meant it was firm or fibrotic. It looks, it has these very dense fibrous appearance to it as well that also suggests it might be a little bit densely packed, firm, fibrotic kind of a tumor. So I, I, think, I think that a, a safer option would be what Eduardo also proposed would be a craniotomy or at least a staged operation and uh, maybe starting out with one or other approach. Um, generally speaking, when we're gonna do staged approaches, we do our transphenoidal first. Uh, so we don't get, you know, have the problem of a craniotomy and, and, a, and an opening into the arachnoid and a leak to start with. But I think a craniotomy would probably be the safer if I had to pick just one approach. Uh, N Nelson, if I can pick on this point, you know, I've had experience and I, I heard Bill Caldwell talk about it, uh, partial resection transphenoidally leaving a significant portion and kind of, I, when you say staging, I don't know what period of time in between, but as you, I'm sure, I mean, you know, uh, the, uh, hemorrhagic transformation of the residual is a serious issue, isn't it? Right, right. So you wouldn't, I mean, I, I, again, as I said, you wouldn't be going for, you wouldn't be going for a long interval, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. weeks or something. You, you, you want to do it as soon as, as possible. The other way we've done things in the past in that regard for giant adenomas that are multi-compartmental is to do a combined simultaneous. And um, so you do a combined simultaneous uh, operation, craniotomy and transphenoidal. And that way you uh, uh, eliminate any, any problem about, you know, worry about a hemorrhagic setting in the, the day of or the day after. Uh, M Marvin, how would you handle this? <laughs> so, um... I, I think it's unfair for us to know that it's firm because... I know, uh, I, I, I was, yeah, I wish yeah. I could say it so, so he could give it. Well, let's say you don't know. You don't know. Exactly. The, so I was going to answer the question as if this presented in my clinic. And I, I'm not sure there's any one approach that can remove all the tumor safely because they're all, you're blind in to some part of the tumor uh, through, I think, any approach that you use unless the tumor is soft and just happens to fall out. Um, so, I mean, when, when I look at a tumor like this that has uh, extra, capillar, ex, extra capsular, extra diaphragmatic extension, um, I kind of approach it more like a tuberculum cell and meningioma, and which are firm. And so you do a transplanum, transtubercular, transcellular uh, exposure. And rather than trying to deliver the tumor by softness and, and suction, that you literally find the arachnoid plane, find your optic nerves, decompress your optic nerves and chiasm, and whatever you can't deliver safely because it's blind, then you can come back via one or more craniotomy approaches. So that, that's what I would have approached this uh, via that approach. Okay, should I go on? Jack? No, hold on, let me ask my partner, Carolina. Carolina oh, is oh. Uh, uh, one year into her practice with us, and she did a fantastic fellowship uh, with Chandra Sen and Doug Gonziolka. And I, I'm 
curious how she would handle it. And if I don't know if Mike Ivan is is still on the panel, I'd, I'd like his opinion too. Go ahead, Carolina. You're muted. Hi there. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, again, obviously the consistency would be important here. One thing that does concern me a bit is also um, the edema that we see there on the brain itself that, you know, maybe the dissection planes are going to be a little bit more difficult from an endoscopic standpoint. Being, um, I'm, I'm sure they would tackle this, you know, in Ohio State or Pittsburgh endoscopically and probably do a fine job you know, drilling, I, I totally agree. They would drill out cell uh, planum and tuberculum cell and everything. Um, uh, and I think for me, just starting out, uh, this is probably safer in my hands to do transcranial. Would you I come from the blind side or the good side, Carolina? Um, you know, he's very keen on, on, on his, um, on, on keeping his good side, but I think with the lateral extension that we see there on the left side, I think you probably, I would probably be coming from that left side. Make sure you get it all there. But I would be concerned, you know, if you go at this endoscopically um, and you do leave tumor behind, that you're just gonna make him worse and possibly compromise the vision on the other side if that's what it, you know, if that's what, where the pressure is when, when you have a, a post-operative hemorrhage. All right, Apio. Okay, so, um, well, of course I told you it was a hard tumor, but I didn't know beforehand. So, in fact, I decided to go transnasally endoscopically. And uh, we couldn't get much tumor. We did, but it was very hard, even though using ultrasonic aspirator we had. So what we could take of this tumor, you can see, in the, especially in the sagittal one, we could get a quite a good bit of tumor, but the, that big piece up up there into the third ventricle and the lateral, we couldn't. Uh, this confirmed to be a non-secreting tumor. And he's got <coughs> uh, post-operative diabetes insipidus. He was put on DDAVP. He said there was a mild recovery of the right eye vision, but nothing, nothing very important. Okay, so what happened then is that, well, of course, we asked the people from radiation oncology, they said, no, there's no way for irradiation. And the patient said, well, I don't want any other operation. I don't want to be in risk of losing my good eye. So the endocrine people decide to put him on temozolamide as was told before by, which one of you told about it? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, at, at, at till, one of our neuro-oncologists. Yeah, uh, at, at till, at till. Yeah. And, okay, so the patient said, I don't want to be operated anymore. He was put on temozolamide. Temozolamide didn't work at all. Uh, six months later, the tumor was a little bit bigger, but not enough, uh, I mean, to change his visual fields. But he had a fit on February, and uh, he was put on a carbamazepine. And we said again, we sh you should be operated on. So we decided to go transcalosal to get the tumor, the, that big part. Of, as you can see, tumor was big again. This was post-operative. We went transcalosally, and that was we could take transcalosally. The upper part we could take, the inferior part we couldn't, especially because the patient stated, I don't accept any risk of my vision. Okay, he said there was a partial improvement, he, he was feeling okay. And this was the post-operative MRI. So we could take the big part, but still there was tumor growing up to the left side where he was blind. So what would you do now? Would you go Transylvian? Would you stop? Would you send for radio, radiotherapy? Anybody on the panel, or you can offer your opinion. Can I, uh, Dr. Antunes, I would say, I like your qu quick yes. question. Uh, I, think, I think this is, am I incorrect, but this is a silent corti corticotropinoma, correct? Because it stains for ACTH, Strongly, yeah, yeah. I believe, from what right. you told. So, 
Okay. So this would be classified as a bundle secreting. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, and because it's staying for ACDH, it would be classified as a silent corticotropinoma. About 20% of corticotropin producing tumors will be staying. And they correct the main, and there is, as you may, as you well know, and there is evidence that they may be harder to remove. Uh, do, do you know if it had crook cell uh, changes? Uh, no, I don't. Think. There was no, there were no crook cells. Because I I, re I recall a paper where uh, where they a particular paper where they uh, report the, the results of gamma knife reader surgery in patients with crook cells adenomas and silent cortopinomas. I'll, I'll 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 try to find and send to you if I find it. But yeah, I, you know, no. I, I, yes, I, but I, the I question don't... was the people said it's too big for irradiation. No, no, yeah, no, for sure. I, I, I was just wondering if they tend to respond. I think this paper in particular, in particular, look at, at the response to radiation uh, yeah. in particular. But I think that that uh, it would qualify as a corticotrop, uh, uh, silent corticotrope adenoma. You know? Okay. Any other? I tell you what I would do. I okay. would. I mean, I would not have done the the transcalosal. I would have done left cranioorbital uh, extradural clinoidectomy to enter the cella from, uh, and uh, of course, intra and extradural resection coming in from the blind side, cutting the left optic nerve, the blind nerve, if necessary, and uh, going, you know, doing maximally what I can do. Uh, and, and that's it. That's, I think, what would my approach would be. Okay. Should I go on? If nobody else, yeah, sure, go on. Okay, so tumor was still there. The big part up was gone. So we said the patient, you have to go again for a new operation because the tumor is growing up. And he said, I accept, but I don't accept any change in my vision of right eye. So we decided to go transylvia terrenal approach. We did, as you said, we sectioned the left optic nerve We've taken the most we could, but there was a still tumor remaining. So we decided to irradiate him. He was irradiated. And uh, I, I didn't get the, the films, recent films after radiation, but there is still tumor there. And the patient still have the same vision on the right eye. So the question is, is there Anything else to be done for this patient for this remaining tumor? He was radiated two years ago, I see from the date. That's right. My, my, my opinion is, I mean, it's too early to, to, no, I think you sit tight and wait. Uh, I'm not sure if my, if my colleagues have a different opinion. Yeah, I, I, I don't see a reason, of, I don't see a reason to do anything else at this minute. Okay, but so, so you're, you're going to be forced to do. He may not respond to radiation, though. So you may want to save that your next surgery for the next <laughs> uh, the, the next chapter in this in this saga. But what approach? It looks like the tumor dropped, and you could actually go transphenoidal again. Um, yeah, because most of the tumor is inside the cell now. If the tumor grows, then you, you, the only option you have is surgery. You don't have any other option now if the tumor grows. And if the tumor grows, with this tumor, what we see here, the best option is transcellara again. Uh, but okay. two, the tumor, if the tumor doesn't grow, doesn't do anything, just wait a little bit. The only the, the difficulty obviously is if it was already firm. Um, I'm imagining that the radiation is not going to help in that in that scenario. Yeah, and is there a, a specific Brazilian juice you can put on this that loosens it? Yeah, maybe orange juice. <laughs> 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 At this stage, um, pasteurotide. You know, if you're asking about medical therapy, could be tried since. There's a wealth of data about using it in Cushing's disease, and this is a silent corticotrope adenoma, that it does affect tumor shrinkage. Um, you know, earlier it was a huge tumor, but at this point, something to at least prevent it from growing further, it could be attempted. It, it might worsen diabetes. It's his most common side effect. Well, I tell Fernando. 
I'll tell Fernando's a Fernando's in Porto Alegre. He's also met Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know Fernando. Also. I, I, I know it may shrink a little bit the, the tumor, but it, it's fairly comparable to a creatine, and it's it would be a modest decrease at the expense of almost a, a, a big percent develop diabetes with the drugs. So I'm not sure if it's going to do much with it. Yes, and my feeling, you know, I, 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 I show this case because besides the fact that it was a hard and very big tumor, the patient said definitely, I don't accept any change in my vision. So one had to be very careful in all, the, all these operations not to damage the right eye. That was my, my worries because perhaps I could have taken much more tumor in, in one of these operations. But the question that he wouldn't accept. So I was very, very careful, perhaps more than I should do, but I, I've been very careful. The first, time, the first time around when you did the surgery, um, did you do any optic, like bony optic canal decompression from the endoscopic? No, I didn't, no. The approach. I, I want to congratulate you that you didn't blind them on three different operations. So <laughs> that's an achievement in itself because uh, these giant pituitary adenomas have a very high surgical complication rate. We, I think there was a mention of apoplexy, which is not unique to transfernoidal approach. I mean, every approach that you performed um, had that same risk of apoplexy. And it usually occurs in the softer tumors, by the way. I, I think that's my experience. But uh, um, I think that you're going to have, from three different approaches, so much scar tissue in there now that a fourth operation will, will run that high risk of blindness and and you given radiation just two years ago, I would not touch this with uh, a 10 foot endoscope. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I can invite you, any of you, to operate on him. <laughs> well, okay. Hopefully it won't be needed. Thank you, yeah. Abdul. It's a great case. Uh, um, come, please come to the sunset in Porto Alegre, please. We, we will, with a picture like this, who can resist? Thank you. Well, Thank you. we'll finish. We'll finish up with uh, with another Brazilian, Carolina. Maybe maybe we can spend a maximum of ten minutes fielding, any, if necessary, up to ten minutes. So any questions you've come across in the Q and A from the audience? Okay, so a few questions, good questions here about all the excellent talks. Um, how helpful do you guys think dynamic MRIs are in identifying not, uh, functioning microadenomas that were not detected on a conventional MRI with pituitary protocol? I think they're very helpful. Yeah. Okay. They do them all the time. We haven't found them as helpful as, as we would have liked. Um, the number of cases that with high resolution 3T scanning that we found one on um, dynamic imaging is very low and they're very equivocal often. They, they, they're hard to interpret, in, at least for our, our radiologists. We, we, we like them quite a bit here at UM also, Marvin. Um, you know, my our endocrinologists can attest to cases that are better. Now, is there not 100%, but better seen compared to a static MRI? I don't know. I want to speak for them, but oh, we, we do them. I'm just saying, uh, in my experience, yeah. I, I just they haven't. They, they've been helpful in a minority of cases. We use a lot of d dynamic because I, I think that for small tumors, it's very helpful. Yeah, and <laughs> I think for small tumors, micro is very helpful. Maybe I still can comment also, but I recall at least two or three cases within the past two or three years that. That we're not the tumor was not seen on conventional MRI that we turn over to OR twenty five, case to follow, turn over to OR twenty five, case to follow. That, that, that's not me. I wouldn't operate on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh Carolina, next question. All right. Um Dr. Isiku, what is your criteria to take a patient back for an early second op uh, exploration? Do you repeat immediate post op MRI and consider re exploration? For every patient that doesn't reach a cortisol nadir less than two in the post-op period? Um, no, we don't do post-op MRIs um, on Cushing's um, because as I mentioned in the talk, it's really not an anatomic problem. It's more of a, of a biochemical problem. 
And um, the criteria would be if we found an adenoma on the first exploration, that would be strong evidence to go back. So there was an adenoma found and, it, and uh, we always do IHCs on all our uh, cases. So we'd know if it was an ACTH positive adenoma um, so that would be even more uh, evidence to strengthen our hand to go to go back. Um, if the patient had had an IPSS that strongly localized to one other side, we would feel much more comfortable in going back uh, to extend the margin of the resection, either laterally or medially, depending on which area was most suspect. Uh, and again, if there was a good initial response biochemically, that that you know we didn't quite get all the way down to two maybe we were, we we petered out about nine or eight or something and maybe it came out started out at 40 or 30 something but it had plummeted quite a bit and so we would be very encouraged that we're, we're right there in the in the ballpark to get this patient uh off and running so those would be some of the thoughts that would go into um, the discussion of going back in on a on a, on, a, on an early re-exploration. Okay. Um, what is your actually on that note, Dr. Isiku? Do you guys have intraoperative MRI? No, we do not. And do you feel that not. that's a? Does anyone on the panel have use intraoperative MRI? Maybe at the Doesn't help for for intra. At, at least for uh, cellular adenomas, maybe for for invasive or very lateral for cellular adenomas doesn't give some some uh, help. No. We used to have an intraoperative MRI scan, and basically, if you can't reach it, is the problem with endoscopy. I I, I found it. it's not that you didn't see it; it's that you just can't reach it. And um, Carolina, you know, on the point about the post-op cortisols, mm -hmm. it isn't that infrequent that we see some delayed remissions. You know, I can think of a handful of patients that we've had in the last few years. So I would venture to say, you know, if the, if the surgeon feels that they did a, a pretty good resection and, you know, the cortisol is above two, um, it's reasonable to discharge the patient and have outpatient follow-up. And you'll find, you know, a group of those will actually go into remission. I think we have the same experience, and I just want to, if you uh, believe in episodic Cushing's, uh, some of those patients don't fall as quickly as other patients because I think there are times where they actually have normal corticotrophic function uh, from, their, from their pituitary gland. That's, at least that's my presumption. So um, I think what, Nelson, what you describe is the classic patient that's always on Cushing's that falls very rapidly. Uh, and, but it's these other patients that fall slowly, and sometimes we don't even we don't, we don't want to wait after three days that they're still falling. Yeah, there's a paper out. There's a paper that was written about that some years back from Brooke and and the group at at MGH, and it is in it is in fact the case that there are the delayed responders, uh, but they're a very small cohort. They're not, you know, they're not sixty percent or seventy percent. They're 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 a small. Num uh, percentage of those patients. So if the patient is not fully suppressed in, in terms of their normal gland, yes, they might not fall all the way down. Um, um, whereas if, they are, if their normal gland was fully suppressed, then they have a more likelihood of falling the way down. So I, it's not one decision point. I think it's a constellation of factors all adding up um, that would all point in the direction that you know, you're, you're there, but maybe not quite there. And, um, and that would be how we would weigh the evidence. And just to complement that, I, I, there is some evidence, and that's probably because maybe some of these patients are not completely cured to start with, but that those late responders may have a higher incidence of recurrence in the future. Right. I think that was the case um, in cert at least certainly the big, the big series, uh, Ed series and and, I, and, and, and those kinds of numbers that when you don't get that, you know, it's when it's in the two to five range, where it's sort of a little bit, you know, not quite there, but better. Those are the ones that tend to <laughs> sort of recur down the line more, more likely than not. 
Okay. Um, one more, a couple more questions. Um, do you guys have any tips or tricks on how to find the pituitary stalk in a firm tumor, like uh, the one you just showed, Dr. Antunes? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a good job and a good question. Because if the tumor is very hard, sometimes we don't see the, the stalk. In this case, for example, I, I haven't seen the stalk. I was not sure, but fortunately, in this case, he was hypopit before. So I was not much worried, but it sometimes it's very difficult in my hands. I don't know about the panel. Anyone yeah. else? Yeah, for a supercellar tumor, uh, as I said, if, if you treat it like a meningioma uh, and, and separate the arachnoid and go supercellar, you can, you can drop these tumors. This one was not gonna drop because it was up into the third ventricle, but uh, you can find the stalk just like a craniopharyngioma or meningioma uh, through a, a, a transarachnoid approach. Okay. And one last one, I guess uh, this is coming from Lima, Peru, and they're asking, you know, in these times, has everyone sort of returned back to doing their usual endoscopic transthenoidal surgeries or are there any restrictions that uh, you guys are, are using or have you just been proceeding with uh, precautions at this point? We didn't have any restriction anymore. We, we do the PCR examination two days before and with all the protective masks. And uh, the first pituitary surgery since March was in July, three or four months after. And then after July, we, we get free and we operate everybody. <laughs> yeah. so we protect with masks. Okay. It's very courageous. PCR before. Well, I have one question to the panel. I know the way I'm about to, to the end. Is there any one of the surgeons have experience with fluorescing for better di in between inverted commas to diagnose intraoperative the tumor? I, I haven't, but our colleague John Lee in uh, UPenn and, and several others have uh, talked about it and uh, Paul Gardner in Pittsburgh. I don't know if anybody else on the panel. N Nelson, have you played around with intra-op fluorescence to sharpen your detective skills in finding a microadenoma? <laughs> no, I haven't, but I've seen John's work. And actually, you may know this, uh, John's, the work that he, he did up there was um, a translation of our work in in looking at our tumors that we found the folate receptor overexpression in pituitary clinically non-functioning adenomas. And the tag, the, the tag, the ligand they used was against that folate receptor imaging. So Ah, was, I, see. I did not know that. Okay. Yeah, so but so but yes, I've seen those images, but I personally haven't uh, accumulated any experience in that. Because we have a colleague very close to you, Jax, in Mexico City, Juan Amador. And he has a very nice experience using, and he uses both of the microscope and the endoscope at the same operation. And he but, says that to him, it helps a lot to identify properly the tumor. Okay, Carolina, I think that's kind of most of the questions. Yep. I cannot tell you how much fun this was having all these brains around this panel and I am the audience has had a treat listening to this multidisciplinary panel. I, uh, sorry it went a little long but that's only because it was very fruitful so thank you to all in all parts of the world my good friends thank you we'll hopefully let's meet again in person. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.